this is the Committee of Finance, Economic Opportunities and Tourism. My name is Deirdre Bartman. I'm chairperson of the committee. I'm going to keep my video off just for connectivity purposes for everyone. Today on the agenda, we have a briefing by the Department of Economic Development and Tourism on its business process, outsourcing and work placement programs. Briefing by Saldana Bay IDZ on its skills training and education program for the oil, gas and maritime sector. Briefing by Atlantis SEZ on its skills and education programs in respect of energy and coding. And briefing by Wesker on its export advancement promotion program and the outcomes of the online webinars and virtual international tours. And then we have resolutions and actions at the end. Uh, members, all the general rules for virtual meetings apply. Um, I've not received any apologies to date. Um, if I could just find out if there are any apologies from the floor online, and um, if members could just indicate, please. Thank you. Okay. If there are no apologies, then. Colleagues, um, as I indicated, the general rules apply. If members could then please just introduce themselves. And then um, I'm going to ask that the departmental officials just introduce themselves as well. And then, um, I'm just going to see here quickly. Uh, Mr. Tufi, are you online with us? Um, yes, I am. Perfect. Are you still acting? I'm not actually. HOD should be here today. Is he going to be here with us today? Okay, perfect. Mr. Tiffy, then the HOD or yourself, then depending on who, who is online at the time, can then indicate to us which uh, who will start first. I'm not sure if you've merged the presentations or if you're going to be doing it individually. Um, and then, you know, you can take us then to the introductions and presentations. But members, if you could please just um, introduce yourselves. Thank you very much, Chairperson and everyone. My name is Matlodi Maseko, member of the Standing Committee. Thank you so much, Member Maseko. Good morning, Chair. I'm the member of the committee. She may I just to clear the number of people that have not been muted. Or they didn't mute themselves, and I do hear some keyboard noises, etc. I think Ms. Rorbeck is, is one of them. Then uh, there were some uh, times when your voice was a little bit short, which uh, shows to uh, slow bad with either on my side or on your side. I don't know if some of the others are. Good morning. No problem. Thank you so much, colleagues. I'm just quickly going to mute everyone. Okay, there we go. And then if you are on the floor, you are welcome to unmute yourself or put your video on. Um, regarding the bandwidth, member from the best days, and I'm, I am at the office at WCPP, so I'm using their connection at the moment. So perhaps if you just move around at home, maybe to get a better connection, that might be able to assist. Um, in On that note, uh, Mr. Tiffy, I'm going to then hand over to you for the introductions by the department. And um, then you can jump straight into the presentation. Thanks. Good, good morning, um, Chairperson and, and Honourable Members. Lovely to see you. I'm, I am just stepping in. I'm expecting that HOD, HOD was scheduled to be here, but it is his birthday today. So, so maybe he's a little bit delayed. And Chairperson, um, maybe I hope he doesn't mind us acknowledging him when he comes. Happy um, birthday to the HOD. <laughs> Yeah, he's not here, but uh, we'll see when he comes. I just want to I'll briefly introduce my team. It's it's Ilsa and Nizam. Will you just say a quick hello and introduce yourselves? Um, Ilsa, you want to go first? Uh, thanks, Nizam. Uh, good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Ilsa van Skarpijk. I'm the Chief Director for Economic Sector Support at the Department. Um, thank you, thank Rashid. You, oh, thank you, Rashid. Uh, Chairperson, I'm Nizam Joseph, and I'm the Chief Director for Skills Development and Innovation in the Department. And 
And then, Chairperson, we, we are going to do the presentations. They're not blended together. They actually are separate. Um, I see Bianca's also here. Apologies, Bianca, from, from the DDAC team. Bianca, just have a quick introduction for yourself. Good morning, committee. My name is Bianca Pashlaza Chef. I work at DDAC. Okay, fantastic. So, and then we, we, we do have the delegation from with Kashifa and team. Kashifa, do you want to introduce your team? And then I'll, I'll introduce the Westcro members very briefly as well. Okay, thanks, Rashid. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, thank you for having us today. With me on the call, I'm the Kashifa, uh, the CEO of the Sultana Bairdi Z. With me on the call is Abigail. If you can just show your uh, screen. If you have none. Put your screen on. Okay, great. That's Abigail. She's our associate for enterprise development. And then uh, Anne Tatoy. Also our uh, so associate for contact development, uh, Conrad Joseph. Thanks, Anne. He's our associate in stakeholder management. Thanks, Conrad. Danielle. Um, she's our executive for stakeholder management. Uh, she might have joined on her phone because, uh, mm. uh, yeah, she's doing the school run this, this morning. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have, uh, let me just scroll down the list here. Um, we've got Stanley Matthews. Stan, if you can just put your thing. So uh, Stan is uh, our associate for skills development. And on the call, uh, who will join as soon as possible, is Patrick Lakavane, who is the head of development programs, who uh, Stanley and, and Abigail report to. So thanks for having us here today. Thank you, Kashifa. And um... let me introduce myself. It's Member Makama Boyd. Sorry, I joined a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Member Makamba Bocha. Um, thank you so much. And I also see Member Mvimbi is with us online in the meeting as well. Member Mvimbi, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much, Chairperson. No problem. Thank Apologies you for, for joining us. And no. then, th thank you, Chairperson. And then I'll just have, have um, the, just so that we know that everyone's in the room, Erica. And I see Tim, Tim Harris, the CEO, isn't here, but will you introduce yourself and the West Grove team, please? Oh, Tim, uh, Tim, actually, I didn't see uh, you. There yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, um, just I'm, wanted I'm to actually... introduce the teams and then we'll start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm Tim Harris. I'm CEO at Westcro. Good morning, members. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Yao Pepra, Chief Business Officer at Westcro, looking after exports, investments, film, one stop shop, and the district units. Um, Erica? Good morning, everybody. My name is Erika Yubar. I am head of exports at uh, Westgrow um, and will be also, uh, yeah, uh, joining today's presentation. Thank you. Monica? Hi, Monica Rorvik, head of film and media at Westgrow. Good morning. Good. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Is everyone being introduced? So we, oh, Nadine, sorry, go ahead. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Nadine Smith Clark. I head up the Export Advancement Program. Hi, Rashid. I'm, I'm also here. Uh, Salman Kaji, uh, head of the Invest SA One Stop Shop and acting head of Invest and Promotion. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, um, Chairperson. So I actually just found out um, HOD had to be had to be in cabinet this morning. So I will be acting in his turn today to from our side to manage the queries and and guide proceedings. So without further ado, if you if you're okay, I will proceed then to go to item number two, which was the the briefing by our skills team on the BPO, the business process outsourcing, and the work placement programs. Are we are we ready to proceed, Chairperson? No problem. Thank you so much. Um, in his absentia, please wish the HOD happy birthday for us. Um, and then you may jump straight into the presentation in the order that we set. DDAT, Saldana, Atlantis, Westcro. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson. And so Nizam, um, Nizam, our Chief Director for Skills, will be doing the presentation. Nizam, will you flight your presentation? Uh, 
Yes, I will rush it. So, Chairperson, this is one of our really exciting programs. During the t a time when most industries were shedding jobs during the lockdown period and during just in the post-COVID period, the exciting part was this was a, a standout example of an industry that actually was was creating more work opportunities. And Nizam will take us through it in the in a couple of slides. So, Nizam, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Rashid, and thank you, Chairperson and members. Um, my presentation is obviously as requested on uh, the BPO and Work and Skills uh, Program. So, if, I think without further ado, we'll just do a, the rationale for the program, and I thought we'll first contextualize why and how the program um, was developed. Um, so, very quickly, uh, Chairperson and members, um, the Western Cape has a workforce of just over 3 million, um, of which 680,000 are unemployed, but we have 1.748 million meets. That's individuals of working age, that's not in education or training or employment. In fact, 58% of our workforce um, are not, is not economically active. Those are individuals that are of working age, but they're not economically active in any way. 43% of our youth, that's those who are under 24, is unemployed. Nearly double the unemployment rate of the province. And those are individuals that are currently looking for work. Obviously, if you're not looking for work, then you're not regarded as unemployed by the narrow definition of, of unemployment. 53% um, of the provincial population over the age of 20 years old does not have a matric pass. Um, so it's very difficult for them to um, um, exercise any other options um, with respect um, to training. Now, this high levels of unemployment um, and, and, and relatively low levels of, of education uh, puts a um, explain some of the unemployment, and it exerts a high degree of pressure on the fiscus, presents, presents a myriad of um, social costs associated with social cohesion, crime, gangsterism, substance abuse, poor health choices, and there's a net economic loss um, by these individuals not participating in the economy. And what we do know is that if you've been unemployed for two years or more, um, the chances of you finding employment in the home economy is exceptionally low. And many of the unemployed youth do not have the experience or skills that are likely to lead them into employment. And because, again, they don't have access to many of the TVETs um, through an, a number of reasons, it further exacerbates the problem. So we developed um, these experiential learning programs. Um, and these two is one of uh, two of three experiential learning programs that we have in the department. Um, we provide a stipend of up to 3,000 rand per month per beneficiary. Um, that stipend goes all the way up to 7,500. Now, I know that 7,500 stipend is quite steep given the financial uh, and fiscal position that we're in right now, but many of the trades that we have, particularly the artisanal trades, those candidates, beneficiaries, um, we have to abide by the um, uh, by the minimum wage in the bargaining council in their specific trades and their specific industries. But we typically ask firms to crowd in or support those learners. So we'll typically provide five, five and a half, and companies are expected to top that up. Um, the experiential learning program effectively incentivizes companies to provide experiential learning opportunities to unemployed beneficiaries. They'll provide job ex on the job experience. And from this financial year, um, the bulk of our um, funding, uh, probably 99, 95% of our funding, will be provided to um, beneficiaries uh, who are hosted in companies that provide accredited 
um, program. So that's either a CETA NQF accredited program at the company's expense um, or vendor specific training uh, such as the Microsoft solution developer and the like. Um, we also provide further, and then we also, uh, companies that provide obviously further employment opportunities um, of preference, but we'll talk about um, the weighting of and how we select companies in a later slide. We have, uh, from last year onwards, we recognize the importance of the BPO sector, mainly because it requires a fairly low level um, of technical skills um, um, to participate in that sector. If you're fairly um, articulate and reasonably eloquent um, uh, and have a good telephone demeanor, uh, you can support the BPO um, sector without having any real further education, even though the sector is requiring more sort of technical skills. So each of those BPO jobs adds 300,000 rand to the domestic economy. That's a foreign inflow that comes into the economy. So because it's a foreign inflow, that 300,000 gets multiplied because those individuals will buy things like pick and pay, and pick and pay would buy goods from um, other manufacturers that provide, that sources goods from, from, from the farms. Um, so you get this multiplier effect of these BPO jobs because it's new money coming into the economy. Now, I think that uh, Rashid, uh, the DDG, mentioned earlier that this is the one sector that saw growth. In fact, the offshore um, jobs grew by more than 20%. We've got about just over 30,000 jobs. We added 6,000 jobs um, during the a pandem pan pandemic year. Um, we've got a very strong pipeline of new jobs coming into the economy, and it's these really exciting things happening in the sector. Um, what we have found is that in previous years, we saw salary increases uh, of double digit salary increases for a number of years in the BPO sector. Um, and because of that salary increases, it, um, it negatively impacts the competitiveness of the BPO sector, particularly in winning those offshore jobs. Um, so we needed to um, increase the pool of um, good quality BPO agents and this particular um, initiative is one way um, in doing so. Um, whereas most other sectors are really dependent on the domestic economy, the BPO sector is not dependent on the domestic uh, economy. And the Western Cape is ideally suited for that BPO sector. Our youth have accent neutrality, um, which means that they're easily understood irrespective of which demographic, English demographic, uh, geography they typically service. We have a good phone and a natural conversation style, uh, which uh, improves the quality of that BPO call. We have a strong back office capability, such as IT, paralegal, finance, and accounting that can service uh, um, the rest of the world. In fact, if you, uh, Chairperson, if you, um, call, uh, if you call Amazon or British gas and you want to speak to someone in English, um, um, English, some German and some Polish, all of those calls are terminated here and responded to here in the Western Cape. And we have many of these global brands all service here in the Western Cape. And obviously we have time zone affinity with the European market. That's the rationale for BPO. Now the criteria uh, for participation in the program is that companies need to tell us what they're going to give to the beneficiary. This is only not only a, a, a subsidy, a salary subsidy, but companies need to contribute in a meaningful way to the beneficiary. And in that regard, we evaluate uh, a few criteria and we put it through a very mechanical system and it gives us a score and we then rank that particular score. And th those firms that meet the requirement are then considered for funding, and then within um, the fiscal environment, we will then prioritize those companies with the highest score. So firstly, we look at the value of company contribution to the beneficiary. Um, so that's either top-up funds, a monthly top-up funds, or the value of the training that will be provided by the company for the beneficiary. We also um, look at the nature of training. 
So a structured but non-accredited training program will score less than a vendor certification or a CETA accredited training program. We look at the cost per job for the department. Um, we also then uh, weight the commitment of firms for further employment. So we request for the firms when they apply to inform us what percentage of those candidates that, com that complete the program uh, will they offer permanency or further full-time employment for. And this is obviously weighted and we set a threshold. So that's the criteria for participation um, uh, from a firm perspective when they, when they do submit um, the application. With it, from the perspective, uh, youth perspective, typically um, those youth that qualify or those individuals who qualify for the program, firstly, they must reside in the Western Cape. The beneficiary must be younger than 35, but there are exceptions. We've seen what happened in Saldana and now in Mossel Bay with companies closing down. And we, we do recognize, even though youth is an acute problem uh, in, in, in the province, we do recognize um, that those older than 35 may require some assistance, particularly when those companies close down. The beneficiary must be employed, and the beneficiary must not have worked for the host company before. So that's, those are the two criteria for participation in the program. I will just quickly go into some of the, the budgets and um, um, some of our targets. Uh, so the BPO program, um, has a budget of, we had a budget of about 50 million rand last year. Work and skills, so work placement supply, um, was just over 20 million. Um, we overspent all our funds and absorbed some savings that was in the department in support of youth. Now, obviously, it's not only about youth, uh, it's not only about developing the skills of youth, but there's also a, a very pleasant accidental. Um, 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 consequence in that there's also um, revenue flowing into the households. And very often, these are fairly large households with very little revenue, if, if any, flowing into those households, particularly during a COVID-19 um, year. Um, so we had an APP target of 1,000, 1,500 beneficiaries supported. Um, when we and, and we'll talk about, and we delivered uh, about 4,153 beneficiaries that were supported on our program. And the reason that you have such a big gap between the two is that we also crowd in significant funds from other sources. So from the CETAs, the NSF, uh, private companies that co-fund some of our programs, and the budget of 50 million that you see over here, we crowded in a further 100 and 105 million rand in the year in support of these experiential learning programs. Um, in 2021, the BPO budget increased slightly to 31.44 million. The work and skills budget declined significantly to 6 million. And the reason for that is um, the department experienced severe budget cuts and very difficult decisions had to be made. Um, and I think all, most of our projects experience some type of um, uh, cut in, in, in budgets. I'm just going to talk about some, some uh, highlights, and this is my last slide, uh, Chairperson. So during um, the pandemic year, uh, we had 1,700 unemployed youth in the BPO sector, um, of which 1,000 that we supported, of which 1,166 were offered full-time employment. That number is, is, even though we think it's a fairly high number, but it's, it's much lower, sorry, it's much uh, higher because we didn't engage with all of the BPOs and not all of them provided the information uh, on time. So we think that number of 1166 is significantly higher. Now, the target for the BPO was only 1,000 experiential learning opportunities, uh, but here we presented more than 1,000 full-time employment post the intervention. On, uh, in fact, one of the BP cohorts that um, employed more than 500 beneficiaries, more than 90% of those beneficiaries were offered full-time uh, full employment in the program. Um, we, we were surprised and we, we're still slightly confused because even the programs in prior years, there wasn't any hard skill transfer. It was only experiential learning. And we were thoroughly surprised by how quickly these individuals 
are provided with um, full-time um, employment subsequent to the experiential learning program. To us, it shows that it's not that the individuals lack the skills and the capability and the capacity to participate meaningfully in the economy. It's just that they haven't provided an opportunity to participate in the economy. And once they do, we can see that these individuals are transitioned very, very quickly into full-time um, uh, employment. Um, so that's the last slide, Chairperson um, and, and, and DDG. Is there any questions? I'll, I'll field them. Thank you. Thank you, Nizam. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, would you, would you like us to proceed um, to the next one immediately, or do we take questions after each organization presents? Please, can we proceed to the next presentation, and then we'll do the uh, questions all at once. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Bianca, um, perhaps I'll ask you to just introduce the team um, or introduce this topic. Um, thank you, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Good morning again. Um, I'm going to ask the SBIDZ. They have been requested to talk about the um, Skills and Enterprise Development Project, which, of course, they leverage funding from for, um, and they have done some really amazing work. So I'm going to hand over to Kashifa and her team. Uh, there she goes. Will you upload Kashifa direct? Yes. Thank you. I'm handing over. Thank you. Uh, can everyone see my uh, slides? Yes, we can. Yes, see we can. Can you just maybe put it in presentation mode for us, please? There we go. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, let me just... Oh, my screens have <laughs> collapsed on me. Um, apologies. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we'll be uh, sharing this presentation between myself, Patrick, and Danielle. Um, so, without further ado. So, the, just to set the scene of the strategic framework of our approach to skills development. So, stemming from the, the core of the SEZ program in the DTI's draft strategic framework that they tabled in 2000, actually 2020. Um, so, you can see in that framework that the issue of uh, access to key infrastructure as well as labor and skills pool is a fundamental part of the value proposition of the SEZ ecosystem that uh, they've identified. That means that SEZs are not only about its location and incentives and infrastructure anymore, and they've really taken a more integrated uh, way of uh, identifying all of those uh, latent opportunities when you have an SEZ by, between the backward, forward, and sideways um, uh, activities that happen in an SEZ or that is stimulated from the SEZ. And so one key part of that is uh, skills and, and uh, workforce readiness. And then from the Western Cape uh, strategic frameworks, from the strategic plan from 2019, which obviously uh, adjusted and morphed into the recovery plan, uh, and at its heart was about dignity, job safety, and well-being. And in the overall approach of the jobs priority, um, it's about bouncing back and bouncing up. And there is an acknowledgement that you know there are um, the investment uh, levers, the, the infrastructure levers, the programmatic levers, uh, but uh, in, in that sense, but uh, the the baseline is supported throughout with skills development and various other programs that need to continue um, to support that well, uh, recovery. So therefore, from the IDZ's business framework, taking all of that into consideration, and in our 2025 20, uh, uh, strategic plan, we've set um, a vision of, we've amended our vision, as you can see, it's about understanding that we're in marine and energy and we are a services center, industrial complex, but also the, the high prioritization now on the, the shipyard element. So the infrastructure that the industry needs because the industry needs capacity. And so local and industry re re readiness relevant for the briefing, the brief of today on the strategic priority um, is still relevant then because it's about creating strong and competitive local and regional value chains for these industries that that, that that we are mandated to support. And with that overview, I'll hand over to Patrick. Thanks.
Thank you. Um, thank you, Koshfa. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson and members. Um, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm executive responsible for development programs. Um, Chairperson, we had a exciting four years of development programs activities within the Southern Abbey area, focusing mainly within the Southern Abbey municipal area. But I must also say that uh, a lot of our programs are uh, also, I mean, uh, there's footprints in the West Coast, in, in towns outside of the Southern Abbey municipal area, even in Cape Town. Uh, uh, and it was all uh, really um, uh, dependent on the funding that we'll have, whether we can go outside or just focus here. Uh, and the impact that we had on the on the immediate community that we are um, engaging in uh, are as follows: that over the past four years, we 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 trained over 2,450 beneficiaries in various uh, uh, skills uh, programs, um, uh, apprenticeships, and also learnerships. Uh, and also, we focused on 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 specialized programs also in the past. With the with partnerships with DDAT, we managed also to, to build uh, what we call the uh, a central uh, SME uh, supply database uh, or management system, which we call the WestNet uh, system. It is because what we found out was that um, the community is so small, the business community is so small in Saldana, but companies had to go and register with so many databases, uh, sharing information all over the show and then we came together and built this data this uh, database which is currently still operational and uh under the auspices of Solomon municipality as we talk chairperson on this uh supply development side and enterprise development we also saw the need to do a, a assessment on the capacity of companies or smes that we have in the southern Abbey area and really doing an assessment on to what is it that they are offering and what is it that they do. And we compare the outcomes of that assessment to what we will need uh, or the demand that the oil and gas in the maritime sector will, um, will, will, will create uh, in, in the zone. We initially started with 700 companies uh, and we shortlisted uh, the 700 to 35 companies, taking them through various assessment processes and uh, out of the three, five companies, uh, we, we, re we then um, uh, took them to an assessment where we did a gap analysis on particular gaps that they would need in order to, to be able you know, to take advantage of the demand that will be created by the Southern Bay IDZ uh, uh, and also its tenants in the zone. Uh, we are at a stage where we're still looking for uh, particular interventions, in fact, particular funding also so that we can uh, close those gaps for those companies so that they can meaningfully participate in the oil and gas and also the maritime sector. Chairperson, in our infrastructure project, we've spent over 200 million rands. In fact, uh, we have a, a, a later on in my slides, I'll, I'll give the exact figures, but that contributed to around about 35% of our local spend in infrastructure. And our, our initial target was 30%. And we can, we can uh, confidently say that uh, that figure has been uh, passed, passed. And, and that actually uh, is because of the interventions that we did, with our contract development, our work stream. Uh, we also started a very exciting project. In fact, our, our site offices were supposed to be demolished, but we saw the need to keep that building because of the invest, investment made within that, that, that facility. We then turned it into a shared office space which we call the uh, South Arabia IDZ SMP collab and collab really for co collaboration with the community, with the business community. That shared office space chair is, ma it's, 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 it's managed by us. It is also a facility in giving free services to, to the broader SME and also the community. Uh, I'll also give detail to that in my next slides. Next slide, next slide, please. Um, thank, thank you so much. Chairperson, our, core, our three core functions within development programs is skills development, where we are looking at human capital development, and also that human capital development is informed by 
uh, uh, the demand, the workforce demand that will be created within the zone. But we are not only looking within the zone, we are also looking at industries outside of the zone, hence the, the partnership and cooperation that we are forming with various stakeholders and also players within the community in the South Arabia area. The second leg chapter is called Clockwise Enterprise Development, where we, where we focus on the supply development and also uh, enterprise development, also informed chairperson by the current gaps that we have within the SME markets and also what we will, and also the opportunities or the supply chain opportunities and procurement opportunities that will be created within the zone going forward. Uh, and then the, the, la the third one is contractor development because we realize that for the, far, for the next few years or years to come here, we will be involved in building infrastructure. And it was apparent from our first contract when we put in the bulk infrastructure within the zone that capacity building within the uh, subcontract, the SMEs or subcontractor sector is, is needed. And otherwise we wouldn't have meet our goals of 30% to ensure that uh, subcontractors within this area meaningfully participate within the um, infrastructure project of the zone. So we basically uh, facilitate development and broadening of local skills, and that we do through skills development. Uh, uh, and we also facilitate the comp competence levels of local businesses and enterprises and contractors. And then lastly, Chair, is our strategic response and that development programs actually is our strategic response to the local socio-economic challenges uh, that we actually are facing within the zone. And the reason why we're mentioning that is we also realize that we cannot just implement training programs and interventions where the skills develop on a contract or enterprise development without uh, 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 considering or appreciating the fact that we also are faced with various socio-economic challenges uh, and we wouldn't succeed if we don't um, uh, uh, if we don't have a strategy to respond to those um, challenges that we have in the community. Let's go to the next slide, please. I should get to go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So, in person, our skills development uh, work stream. Uh, currently, what we've done is, in fact, it, it, it's it's um, we had two phases to this. Uh, particular work stream. The first phase was really to look at uh, building basic or elementary skills so that we can have a pool of people that could respond to our interventions and also to the programs that we wanted to, 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 to build. I always um, I mentioned uh, the experience that we had in 2013 when we did our first enterprise skills development program funded by Mesita through DDAC. Uh, we had 30 opportunities then for apprenticeships at Arms School in Simonstown. Chair, we could only meet seven people. We could only get seven candidates from a Salonabe municipal area that actually met the entry requirement. The other seven came from the broader West Coast and then we filled the gap with Cape Town based learners. So that to us we, it was actually important then for us to say, let us first go through a drawing board. Let us build those basic skills so that people can be articulated within uh, our additional programs. Uh, we've done that for the last past for the past four years. We are now focusing on phase two of our skills development um, uh, strategy, and phase two is demand driven. We are focusing mostly on a non unit standard based training, and also uh, on, on the artisanal side. And it is what it is the opportunities that will be created by the. Um, tenants within the zone. Now, clockwise, uh, if I go clockwise, and I start with the shift building and repairs, okay, uh, looking at the current um, investor pipeline that they have and also where these uh, investors are, shift building and repairs will definitely be one area that, uh, that will need a lot of intervention. And for that, Chairperson, we've um, uh, uh, built a strategy and also looking at um, the occupations that we will uh, have to, to train people in, marine fitters, boiler makers, electricians, and that, that's the whole list. And then our investors that we have in the zone that will take occupation in the factory very soon in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and refrigeration. Chairperson has already started to engage with them, and we've already started to identify interventions and also submitted 
those type those uh, application to the relevant cities. All processing and recycling. We all in, at this stage we have three three such projects that that, that will be that will start very soon. Uh, uh, we're also engaging with those uh, investors, looking at the type of training that they would need, and also the type of entry requirements that learners might have if they want to take advantage of those workforce opportunities. And then the mechanical and electrical construction side, uh, that is part of the infrastructure that we will build, and those occupations are actually informed by that, but, 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 uh, by the particular uh, infrastructure demands that will be created both by us as an RDZ and also by our tenants. So I should like to go to the next slide, please. Chairperson from the Enterprise and Supply Development Works team, uh, our current focus um, uh, in, in phase two is really to ensure that our local SMEs has facilities and are also uh, are capacitated to respond to our supply chain demand, both of the IDZ those of our main contractors that building infrastructure and also the demands that will be created on a more permanent basis by our tenants. I alluded earlier on uh, on the collab center that we've, uh, that we've opened. Uh, this is our, our old site offices. It is a off shared office space chair. We opened this facility last year, March, just, um, just before uh, COVID. Uh, we then afterwards, um, receive permission, you know, to operate the center because we realized that SMEs did not have anywhere to go when they were actually app applying for, for, for TERS funding. We, we, we were successful in that and we were actually the only center or the only shared of a space that was opening, operating uh, on level five uh, on the West Coast at this stage. So the co lab is shared of a space. We have nine fully furnished offices three big bed, three boardrooms, apologies, one big one and two smaller ones. Uh, we offer free Wi-Fi printed facilities and also access to laptops to those that don't have laptops. And also uh, the, the facility holds network sessions. There's a lot of training sessions and on the training sessions, not only SMEs are using it, but it's also using by corporates around uh, in South Bay um, and also events uh, that um, some of the uh, business uh, associations and firms um, uh, has. So that um, center or that facility, is, 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 um, it has impact uh, and it's also addressing particular needs of SMEs. On every chair, we, we receive around about 140 um, uh, visits per month. That's now from individuals and uh, uh, on SMEs, around about 42 SMEs on average. In fact, these stats uh, was just the past the last six months that we've, uh, that we've um, managed to get those stats. And um, we also uh, report these stats to our board on a quarterly basis. The outlook on the way forward on the, on the, uh, um, on the collab center, we are currently uh, engaging with a particular center that shared uh, interest in partnering with us in this collab center and also uh, building a smart skill center you know, for the West Coast. Uh, the, the negotiations is at the final stage now, and uh, our goal is to, to have the smart skill set that will service both the community and also the business the businesses and SMEs uh, up and running before the end of the current financial year. Next slide, Kashira, please. Chairperson of contract development uh, and um, our local SME spent on the South Arabia ID, the South Arabia IDZ part. Um, currently, um, our our tenants will soon move in and also uh, build their own. Some of them will build their own uh, top structures. But the figures that we give here are the figures of, from the funding that's been managed by us. Uh, we currently spent uh, 637. In fact. Uh, this is not the updated figures. We're still auditing that up at the, the, the last financial year's figures, which will obviously push that figure up. Uh, of the 637 million range, 222 uh, million was spent on local SMEs and subcontractors, uh, which equates to 35% of the, of, the, of the total spend. 
a lot of support were needed in this area because if you look at um, in fact what we've done is to give a breakdown on, on the various projects that we embarked on and you'll see that some of the projects uh, the spending were were not that good if you look at for instance the northern internal engineering services was started about 11 percent uh, it was then when we when we realized that we need uh, uh, particular intervention to assist local subcontractors, you know, to to positively respond to 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 the supply chain needs in an infrastructure project. Uh, currently, we're giving a lot of support on financial management and forecast, on pricing. Uh, competitive pricing is really a it's, it's a big issue. In fact, it's, a, it's it's one one challenge that we are facing currently with local suppliers. And also subcontractors, basic project management and planning is an issue. These are also interventions that we are currently uh, implementing with partners, human resource management, daily production and planning, also basic management, business management skills are, are areas that we currently have really focusing on and to ensure that our local subcontractors are competitive. Say in terms of our priorities for the near future, uh, between 2013 and 2021, I, I alluded to the fact that we implemented phase one, which was looking at the element, building elementary skills and also co uh, uh, and also competencies. We raised over 55 million rand so far for skills, contract, and also supply development. You know, once again, say chair that our partners, our funding partners, are, are positive. They each and every year they come back because we deliver. On the, on, on the promises that we give them and, and then how we spend that money and also the interventions that we implement. Um, we form strategic partners, partnership with uh, institutions, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, Jay, just as correction, the training, we, uh, tra training over 2,450, not 2,350, it should be 2,450. Apologies for that, individuals, as I alluded earlier on, and also the collab that I spoke about. Our next phase chair, phase two, is to look at what investors' needs are in terms of uh, supplier, contract, and enterprise development, also skills development. Uh, here, Chairperson, our strategy is informed by what by by by, by the demand that, will, that that is created or will be created by by investors. Most of the interventions, Chair, is also specialized and non-accredited, meaning it's non-unit standard-based training. And also uh, the impact there of current now is job creation and also um, having companies that can respond to supply chain. Was we our first one was the impact there was to 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 to, uh, to build elementary skills. Here we are saying the outcome should be job creation. Uh, and also uh, we are targeting strategic funding from CITES, uh both in building the. Um, the, the, uh, the smart skill center at the collab and also uh, looking at the um, uh, capacity building or human capital side uh, of skills development. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. I will then hand over to uh, to Danielle with the Southern Bay Skills Club. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks very much, Pat. Good morning, Honourable Chairperson and members. Um, I'll be doing the slide in front of us just with regards to our schools program. So our schools program is a program that we're extremely passionate about and we're also very excited about. It forms part of our innovation campus, but linked to what Patrick was saying around ensuring that local citizens of Saldana Bay <clears throat> have the requirements and are ready to leverage all the opportunities that are coming from the industry, we've decided to focus on a schools program. So our schools program for the past year has focused on developing the capabilities of maths teachers in high schools. So we've included all nine high schools in Saldana Bay and the grade eight maths teachers specifically. So the training program has been a 20 week online training program. It's an accredited training program that's run in partnership with Wits University and Stellenbosch University. It's also a program that's been specifically designed to respond to the needs of, of the local teachers in Saldana Bay. 
So it's a professional practice program that looks at the application of dynamic software for secondary mathematics teachers. So it's all about the digital age and digital technology. So it's about building the capacity of the teachers, their digital skills, their technical skills, but also their leadership skills. So ensuring that, that the local teachers, and obviously it came in very useful during the lockdown and while learners were at home, um, giving teachers the necessary skills to utilize the internet, utilize digital capabilities to enhance sort of the, the impact of their teaching. And the, <clears throat> the ultimate outcome that we're working towards is improving the mathematics outcome of, of learners in the Saldana Bay region so that they're able to enter the maritime sector. So I think it's important to note that we've done this in partnership, as I've said, with, with WITS and, and Stellenbosch University, but also the Western Cape Education Department, specifically the West Coast District Department under the leadership of, of Heather van Ster. So the department have, have been a significant partner um, and they've also been very supportive throughout the entire program. So I think it's also important to note, Honourable Chairperson, that the schools programme not only forms part of the Innovation Campus, but it's part of our Community Engagement Initiative. So what we've also done is we've placed a 3D model sorry, of the zone at each school, which means that every learner has the opportunity to walk past this model and they've got a visual il illustration of what the zone will look like in a few years to come, which means that we see in the minds of, of young learners in the maritime economy or of the maritime economy where they can start dreaming of seeing themselves in the maritime economy. So this is something we we're very excited about, Honourable Chapers. And, and of course, you know, this is all done, you know, with, with, with the various partnerships that, that we've put in place. And I think Patrick will take us through the last slide around partnership. So, Kash, will we move to the next slide for Patrick to conclude? No, sorry, Daniel. <laughs> um, hey, can you see the slide? Yeah, no. the last slide. Oh, okay. No, I, I wanted you to also sorry. address that, but but I can I, but I can talk to it. So, I mean, uh, over, over the years, we've we've uh, invested in a lot of different partnerships because we we do it uh, together. Uh, we need to do it together in order to make enhance the success of the IDZ. So um, over the years, we've worked with many different stakeholders from business, government, and society. To and this is going to be what we invest in uh, going forward into the future. So there are just some pictures there of you know us at work, you know, and I think a lot uh, what we've realized a big part of our work is actually getting people to site and seeing the the IDZ and seeing the vision that we have. Um, and how it relates to their work and their mandate and uh, their realm of influence. So um, we have many different uh, strategic partners that whom we call strategic partners and in the skills and development program uh, space front and center are the seaters and then uh, then the community itself. We have a community skills and training committee in partnership with the local municipality. The different private companies that participate as service providers, as training, but also as you know, housing our candidates for that experiential training, and so forth. So there, there are many more, and that is the last slide that we have. Um, so uh, we'll take questions later then. Thank you. Thank you, Kashifa and team. That was fantastic. I feel like we could have spent a whole standing committee just on that, but thank you for the detail. And it's amazing to see something that I remember being just the drawing became a 3D draw model. And now it's um, now it's actually something you can walk about and touch and feel. So amazing. It's just really amazing to see the foundational stuff you did and continue to do at schools, you know. So um, for the next segment, appear I didn't see you and your team. At, I think um, Teams doesn't allow me to see everyone who's here. So apologies that I didn't introduce you, Pierre. So Ellen and um, I think Wahida is also with you. But uh, welcome, welcome to you and your team. Bianca, I don't know if you want to do a quick introduction of the segment before I hand over to, to Pierre and Ellen, yeah? No, I think it's absolutely fine. The committee probably doesn't want to hear from me. Let them hear from the SEZ. Thank you. Cool. So over to you, Pierre. And... Um, 
yeah, as you saw from the last one, it, it does all start out as a picture, but one day we'll be, <laughs> we'll be walking about and seeing it as well. But over to you. Thanks, Rashid. I was a bit worried when you didn't introduce us, but um, with us, with me in the team is um, Ellen Fisher, um, myself and, um, and Waida Saeed. Um, I'll do a quick intro to what we want to say. Um, as you know, we had our first year behind us now. And from the start, we placed a very, very strong emphasis on the community skills development and um, enterprise development. We've done some groundwork in terms of uh, research where the gaps are in Atlantis in terms of skills development and um, enterprise development. Dr. We Rose, I'm apologies for interrupting you. Used um, that, a little um, bit on Dr. Vogues, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Is it Vogues or Vogues? Vogues, doesn't matter. Vogues, apologies. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fuches, um, there's just a bit of an echo in the background. I'm not sure if there are two laptops maybe on with the, the, the with the sound. If if we can just have that checked quickly, please. Okay. okay. Maybe unmute and try again now quickly. Is it better now? Yes, it is better. Thank you so much. So. From the start, uh, Chair, we placed a very strong emphasis on the community and something I've learned in the past how important that is. And we've done some research in terms of skills and enterprise development to see where the gaps are in Atlantis, not only in respect of the issue. Actually got us to launch some skill development programs and enterprise development programs with a direct aim of not
principles around uh, science, maths, um, uh, digital literacy. So uh, you'll see that our skills development uh, focus is really on building foundational skills because if we don't have the foundational skills, the other skills such as technical and specialized really um, become impossible and are almost uh, obsolete. So the foundational skills, when we look at technical skills, we really, we're really looking at technical skills around um, existing businesses and the businesses that we wish to attract. So it's uh, base, it's boiler making, it's welding, uh, really those kinds of technical skills. And when we talk about um, specialized skills, um, the programs that we are focusing are on matters such as uh, green ambassadorship, and that speaks to uh, conservation, biodiversity, but also emerging markets and, and such as that of um, South Africa and Atlantis in specific, understanding um, what opportunities there are uh, for new business models within this green economy and, and mitigating matters such as, as, um, as climate risk and climate change. And then um, the third level, um, and the smallest level, I would say, would be around management, uh, around supervisory skills that are required in, in uh, manufacturing facilities, and uh, also a focus on interpersonal skills. And those interpersonal skills speak to matters such as leadership, um, conflict re resolution, communication. So those are the skills that we, uh, we identified in uh, the audits done to date. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit more about how, what that skills audit led us to and so pro programs that we are running. The first one I'd like to again um, it, uh, confirm is the STEM education and STEM stands for science, technology, engineering and maths. If we're talking about manufacturing, if we're talking about the economic zone that focuses on green technology and, and green economy related skills, then again, your foundational skills such as uh, maths and technology are critical. So we do that in partnership with Ikamba Youth, and um, they run an after-schools program uh, where uh, our high school learners, um, all the high schools have access to this program, and it happens at one uh, high school. We um, impact about 120 learners a month um, that actually all are part of this program, and they come for um, maths lessons actually and science uh, lessons uh, three times a week and which resulted in uh, December when uh, we had or January in which results came up uh, that the incumbent youth had a 98% uh, pass rate for uh, their matrix in science and maths. So the focus on foundational uh, literacy uh, is really proven by this um, by the results of this program. We run technical skills uh, regarding water and waste management. It speaks to um, a labor intensive work that is directly related to, um, to job creation. And then also we focus on um, industry folk, on, on, on industry or new industry that we wish to attract to Atlanta Special Economic Zone. So our big focus is on renewable energy and we've just completed training um, for in renewable energy workshop assistance programs. And this was um, 30 individuals um, that uh, were introduced. Some of them had no technical background whatsoever, but the training was um, hosted by Saratech, which is um, the South African Renewable Energy Technology Center, and where they learned different skills uh, around uh, PV solar installation, maintenance, uh, but also general maintenance in a workshop. Um, and then combined with these very technical skills, we uh, implement uh, projects such as uh, project implement. So we, we manage as part of the integrated ecosystems team, we manage the project implementation and that means that we're in constant engagement with our service providers, uh, with the training institutions, but also with the community to ensure that uh, we minimize dropout, to ensure that a training remains relevant and not only that, that those skills that they have acquired can be translated into either finding uh, paid employment or creating uh, businesses. Um, none of the work that we do uh, would be possible without our partners. And I think if I listen to the previous presentations, uh, partnerships is key. We talk about um, collaboration. I think it's quite a buzzword uh, that people have been using. That people have been using for years. But I think that with all the 
uh, the budget constraints and just um, the tough economic times that we cannot render services in an effective and a, in a, um, efficient way if we don't um, engage our partners, make sure that our, pro our programs are aligned um, and that we leverage them as well. Um, what we've embarked on as the Atlanta Special Economic Zone is the concept of a living lab. And this is something that we are really pushing. So besides the very, uh, if I can say, hard skills and, and technical aspects of running an eco-industrial park, we're really looking at um, growing, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic development, fostering inclusion uh, within the regional context here. And so that means that uh, in very simple terms, it means we work with multiple partners. So we see the Atlantis community and the special economic zone as um, a natural setting for this uh, living lab. We work obviously with our partners that come from public uh, sector, our public actors, but we also ensure that the, uh, there's a multi-stakeholder approach. So that means that we also bring on board and we engage constantly with our SMEs, but existing Atlantis um, industries. Those are our private actors, and we also um, actually just kicked off uh, our, our partnership with the University of Western Cape, who will be supporting us in uh, building the, the case study and providing the scientific data and also um, uh, informing the monitoring and evaluation systems that we're putting in place for this concept of the living lab. So um, they actually also are some form of accountability partner. Of course, we cannot uh, forget the community in this because um, when we talk about a multi-stakeholder approach, the community is a key factor, and not only the community from a business perspective, but also looking at elements of general health, education, and social development uh, within Atlantis. Uh, um, I've alluded to that, um, so our uh, UWC will be our academic partner um, at uh, providing, the, on the, as I said, the scientific um, the knowledge the framework that we require to not only speak about the living lab, but to actually implement that, and also to encourage knowledge transfer um, within the community and uh, within the, linking the sciences to community. For our new financial year, we've received uh, a two million rand funding from the MERSITA program, so that will help us um, scale um, the amount of people that we can impact with regards to technical um, technical training. I was asked to speak about the coding school. Unfortunately, um, we have not been able, purely to a uh, budget constraints, to be able to uh, set up a coding and ICT related skills development uh, program. Um, it is a very uh, strong requirement that we introduce this kind of technology and uh, program into Atlantis because um, whilst very much focusing on labor intensive opportunities that we need to create for um, uh, you know, our community, it's also important that we take the community into the digital economy, which very much needs to be the new economy, and um, software skills and hardware skills. So when I speak about hardware skills, if we're looking at local manufacturing and components that are required for green technologies, for example, I'm using, I'm thinking of the wind turbine uh, component manufacturing, I'm thinking of PV solar manufacturing, then we would want those components to be locally uh, manufactured because we have the infrastructure there to, but to um, ensure that those components are well programmed and that um, they meet all sorts of uh, quality management standards, uh, the community also needs to be uh, trained more in the software development side. Pierre alluded to um, the community integration and development program that we're running. So in December of uh, 2020, we signed a community uh, stakeholder agreement between um, the ACZ company and the CSN, as we call them. And what that means is that we actually have a partnership with these um, 10 different um, leaders that have been selected by communities. So we've uh, divided the community to different sectors, uh, business, informal traders, traditional culture, uh, sorry, traditional co uh, council culture groups, labor, education is um, split into uh, early childhood development, into 
higher education but also into uh, technical training, um, further um, educational training, faith-based and civic. And um, the leaders or the community stakeholder network members that sit on this committee have been selected by um, the organ by the organisations that actually represent these different sectors within the Greater Atlantis community. Um, it's a very interesting work um, because it requires a lot of capacity involving. There uh, have been huge issues with regards to trust uh, in the community, and so ensuring that. Uh, the community has faith that we operate in their best interest, but that they're also equipped to understand how to engage formal business and how to access opportunities uh, within um, a, le a legislated environment and commercial environment. We are doing a lot in terms of uh, capacitating the leaders. So on the one hand, those are the soft skills that I referred to around uh, government leadership training, conflict resolution and communication training. But it's also matters such as uh, governance and understanding how to operate within um, a formal setting. They've also been trained around matters such as project management. So it's one thing for us to say, um, you know, uh, these are the opportunities that are coming, but it's another thing for the community actually to be capacitated to understand uh, how they manage their own projects internally, but also. Um, what sort of business administrative skills they require um, to adhere to compliance and also um, uh, the government. Um, lastly, just a, some of uh, an image of uh, Alderman James Foss who attended um, the Saratech, so that's the, um, the Renewable Energy Workshop Assistance uh, Program that um, I referred to, where we have 50% uh, of women. I was very pleased with that. And we're very intentional about ensuring that when we recruit also on behalf of our partners, that we make sure that the greater Atlantis community is involved. So that includes the areas of Mamla and Pella, and that we also are actively ensuring that uh, women are included and youth as well to, um, that, to ensure that there's um, balance in, in, in the different uh, representation that we have in our groups. So you'll see that it focuses from a technical training like water and waste treatment, um, but also to matters such as the business administration and, and early childhood development um, that we're also focusing on. Okay. And then uh, lastly, just to mention, um, again, going back to elements and, and the topic of collaboration um, with the city of Cape Town, um, have, uh, they have co-founded and we've worked together on the technical training, such as the basic uh, welding, mechanical and boiler making. Um, with provincial government DDAC, um, they are supporting us with regards to the workplace program. Um, I think Patrick from um, the SIDZ alluded to the fact that it's one thing to train people, um, but the next thing that you need to support, uh, and sometimes therefore your numbers are lower that you can afford with regards to budget. Uh, when you train people, but you also want to give them the workplace experience so that and that requires budget for uh, stipends so that they are either employable or that they can actually apply the skills that they've learned in a theoretical uh, context. And then the partnership with Green have um, actually assisted us with, um, has assisted us with enrolling, um, enrolling out the Ikamba Youth Program and also the artisanal training that we did at the South Africa. my uh, update from the um, skills development perspective. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. I just want to clarify one thing that um, you may have seen. Um, Alderman Foss has been in the one slide with his arms opening the whole world, and I just need to clarify that. The city of Cape Town is now a minority shareholder in the SED company. In fact, at the moment, they are 46% shareholder in the SED company. So the one slide that Ellen has um, outlined um, shows a very strong collaboration with the city of Cape Town, particularly in their role as a shareholder. And that shareholder aspect will also run through many other parts, such as um, um, building approvals, uh, zoning, EAAs, and so forth. It's sometimes better to have the city, I suppose, as a shareholder. So if you see the picture of Alderman Foss, he is often in Atlantis. Um, representing the, the city's interest uh, in the SED company and 
in Edmonton. Uh, but as Glenn explained, if there was ever a very strong working partnership, not a planned partnership, a working partnership already, which is particularly with the city of Cape Town, with DDAC, with Green Cape, and also many other institutions such as the different universities that, um, that Ellen had mentioned. Okay, that concludes our presentation, and obviously we open for, for questions when, when you decide when that's not happening. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to quickly go over to West Coast presentation. And then I do know we asked for feedback at the previous meeting regarding the CAFCETA meeting um, that was coming up. So I'm going to allow for that. And then we can do a quick bathroom break before questions. But just in terms of the Atlanta Special Economic Zone, what uh, Dr. Fuchs was saying about the city of Cape Town being minority shareholder, and we did have uh, that information previously already, which is wonderful. Um, just uh, just a reminder to perhaps also invite the minister and and the committee also to some of the events, given that we are also as a province the majority shareholder to the ASEZ. Uh, that would be appreciated. But with that. Um, Wiskra, you're up next. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll kick off and then hand over to Erica, and then I think Tafik is going to come in at the end as well. You didn't uh, meet Tafik in the intro, but I'm sure you know who he is. He runs our district unit, um, which is going to respond to some of the queries we got at the last uh, meeting around how they work with uh, LEDs. Um, but I think it's also important from the export context because uh, Tafik and the district unit team actually represents the sort of full suite of, of support uh, that Westco provides to investors and exporters, uh, but, but is working with the rural municipalities to land those efforts uh, around the Western Cape. So I think that will be an important update at the end of the slides. And I think we, we were also asked about specific examples of smaller exporters joining our, our platform. So that's in the, in the slides too. But in general, the, the main request was for an update on the, the export area. And you met Erica earlier. She's, I think, on day one, if I'm not mistaken, of her formal leadership of the export team. Uh, and she's also joined by Nadine Smith-Clark, who runs the Export Advancement Program, um, which is where we help uh, companies with the potential to export become exporters. So you could take it, they're going to take you through uh, the efforts of the broader export team and the export advancement program during COVID. And it's a similar story to what you saw in the BPO space with Nizam. This is one of those sectors that managed to turn a crisis into an opportunity, notwithstanding some of the uh, constraints to trade and the logistical issues that were faced, particularly in the early stages of the lockdown. You have uh, a sector that was supplying an increased demand uh, globally, particularly for fresh fruits and vegetables, which the Western Cape is very strong in. Uh, and that meant that actually we had a bumper season. But uh, part of that uh, performance is down to the work of Erica and the broader team in the uh, West Coast export team. And they're going to take you through that update now. Thanks, Tim. Let me just share my screen here and make sure everybody can see this. Um, are you able to see this? Yes, we yes, are. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, as Tim said, my uh, name is Erica Hubert. I'm the head of the export unit at Westgrove, day one. Uh, yeah, and thanks for having us. Um, uh, yeah, as we were asked, I will do a briefing on West Coast Export Advancement Promotion Program and the outcomes of our online uh, webinars and uh, virtual missions. Um, yeah, last year was pretty interesting uh, with the restrictions on travel and large gatherings uh, in place from uh, early 2020, given COVID. Uh, all the activities conducted by the West Coast Export Unit was virtual or hybrid uh, during the last financial year. Even so, the export team uh, surpassed most targets. Uh, rand value export declarations for the year came in at uh, 4.7 billion rand, exceeding the higher band target of 4.1 billion rand with 14.6%. Uh, rand value outward foreign direct investment came in at 730 million rand, also exceeding the higher band target of 550 million rand. And the team signed a total of 66 export agreements ahead of the higher band target of 65. A direct jobs as a result of export deals came in at 357, 
uh, missing both the lower and higher band target. As we all know, job layoffs during the COVID period has been significant, uh, and we have certainly seen companies trying to keep uh, their current employees employed. Uh, the uncertainty around the business environment the last year did affect companies considering expanding teams, uh, which contributed to new uh, direct jobs falling short of its target. Uh, with that said, this will remain top priority for West Coast Export Unit as we expand and scale our uh, export offering this coming year. Um, one of the ask was as a res uh, the outcomes as a result of uh, virtual network sessions. Um, so in order to, to really build out or further build out the exporter ecosystem, it is important to raise awareness and educate exporters around uh, export and investment opportunities, challenges, new developments, and so forth. Um, and as such, Westgro, we, sorry, Westgro's export unit hosted or presented in 42 virtual export networking sessions, such as webinars, workshops, focus groups, and so forth. The sessions were broken up in three sections. Um, there was a business support section, the export uh, sector region awareness session, and the impact of trade agreements. The business support sessions was largely linked to helping exporters understand COVID restrictions, how it impacts their business, what they can and cannot do. And uh, there was a significant ask from how to move our, uh, cargo between the, the farms to the factories, to the plants, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the port, uh, which is quite tricky. So support was given in that sense. Then, uh, as you can see, the bulk of our uh, sessions was as it relates to export sector and regions, uh, region awareness sessions. Um, Kind of opportunities within Africa, within Europe, within Asia, within the US, uh, sector opportunities as it relates to boat building, organic, natural ingredients, there were quite a big focus on that, uh, cannabis, um, as well as wine. Um, and then also, uh, what's the impact of trade agreements and helping our exporters understand uh, what a trade agreement is and, and how it impacts and make them more competitive uh, in international markets, uh, such as the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and there was quite a few sessions around Brexit and, and educating our exporter base around that, as well as a go up. Um, one of Westgrove's key export services is export training and development, uh, which is done through the Export Advancement uh, and Promotion Program, which is called the EAP, which is headed up by Nadine Smith Clark, who's also on the call. Um, yeah, the EAP consists of export training, seminars, and mentorship, uh, including introduction to exports, financial risk management, uh, export logistics, costings, inco terms, and developing an export marketing plan. It's a, it's a really intense two-week program that's cut up uh, through different days, really providing a new exporter the understanding about what is exports, what they need to do, uh, and, and what's the ABCs, and where do you start, and where do you end. Um, in addition to actual the training, and it's really practical training, there's also um, export missions that forms part of the program, uh, supporting emerging ex ex sorry supporting emerging exporters with accessing international markets. Um, due to COVID, uh, the EAP pivoted completely to an online offering. Um, the team conducted seven online courses uh, across the metro and the district's municipalities, uh, supporting 148 companies in total. Uh, the mentorship program also continued, and this too was offered online. Uh, in the mentor programs, exporters are assisted with refining elements such as their export strategies, uh, the costing structures, packaging and logistics. And in total, 56 companies were mentored, 31 from the mentor and 25 from the districts. I think it's also worth important to note, both as it relates to the networking sessions, as well as the, the, the training courses and the mentoring courses, something that we learned as an export team is we used to do everything in person, which um, was actually, it prohibited some of our companies and our smaller, smaller uh, exporters and, and businesses from the districts to join because of time commitment and traveling into the city and so forth. Uh, and we're certainly looking to see how does it, a hybrid model working, uh, looking, yeah, how do we uh, deploy a hybrid model going forward where we can still support uh, in person in Cape Town, but also then virtually link in with our uh, exporters in the in the districts to be able to give that same support to them as well. Ultimately, uh, leveraging technology to help scale what we were doing. Before I go to that, as it relates to EAP outcomes, there's 27 exporters uh, that participated in the 2020-2021 EAP program, participated in 34 virtual missions during the same financial year. Um, some emerging exporters participated in more than one exhibition, uh, hence the 34 uh, virtual missions in total. Additionally, 35 exporters that participate in the EAP prior to the 2020-2021 uh, financial year participated in the export units virtual missions uh, last year, 
In total, they participated in 50 virtual missions uh, because several signed up for more than one mission, depending on their market and sector focus. Um, the result of their part participation was 14 export declarations signed with a RAND value of 517 million RAND and 20, uh, 28 jobs. Uh, Tim alluded to in the previous standing committee, uh, there was a ask just to give a couple of examples from um, some of the, the exporters. Um, one of them was uh, Pardon Club of Wine Estate, uh, who completed the training, uh, the mentorship, and then joined missions to Russia, Africa, as well as uh, Cape Agri Week. Uh, we also have Funky Omar, um, of course, uh, who's, who's making spices. Um, they also uh, completed the export training, the mentorship, and they secured orders from Germany as a result, um, as well as the Middle East, actually. And then uh, also Cape Honeybush Tea, uh, based in Mossel Bay. Uh, they also did the training, they did the mentorship, and then they did missions to South Korea and Germany, and they were also able to secure export declarations from both of those markets. Um, <clears throat> Moving from kind of export uh, uh, training to, to the actual missions that we're doing is, um, yeah, it's another key service provided by the West Coast Export Unit, um, really helping exporters to connect with the international market. And we're doing that, uh, that through trade exhibitions, study tour, inward buying missions, uh, outward selling missions, and so forth. And uh, all of these uh, were planned out for the 2020-2021 financial year, and then we had to pivot into the virtual space uh, given the, the COVID restrictions. Even so, the team were able to execute on 40 missions connecting Western Cape exporters uh, with importers in Africa, Asia, Europe, Americas, and Middle East uh, through various forms. And I'll show a couple of examples, but it, can, uh, it could be leveraging technology, leveraging Zoom technology, building uh, platforms, uh, leveraging hybrid models, and so forth. As it relates to outcomes from these missions, uh, the 4.7 billion rand in export declarations that I, I talked about in the first slide was largely driven by trade in Africa, which represented 53% of all the declarations, followed by Europe, uh, that represented 30%, as you can see on the table on the left. Um, in contrast, the 357 direct jobs were, smoothly, uh, uh, were mostly driven by trade uh, with Europe, representing 40%, followed by Africa at 32%. The graph on the right provides a breakdown of declarations as a result of in-market versus uh, versus virtual and hybrid activity. Um, and as you can see, 80% of the 4.7 billion rand in export declarations came from in-market export missions done prior to the 2020-2021 financial year, with 11% as a result of hybrid missions uh, in the most recent financial year. It is worth noting that export deals after a mission can take uh, up to from anything from one to three years. Uh, so it's not surprising to see only a small percentage linked to virtual missions at present. And the expectation is that we'll see actual result from last year's virtual missions in this upcoming financial year only. Um, yes, and we thought it might be good to just share and give a few virtual representations in terms of what this, uh, the missions look like. Um, so our Africa export desk, uh, they were first out of the blocks and they hosted Africa's first virtual export mission to Guinea, uh, connecting exporters and importers via group calls, leveraging uh, Zoom technology. Uh, and this team also, they were, they were really able throughout the year, able to pull in large group of exporters and large groups of importers, anything from 20, 30 uh, uh, exporters, um, and then uh, meeting with 50, 60 importers over a two, three day period. Um, then in addition to that, uh, our South Africa's first hybrid mission came from West Coast Asian Export Desk, uh, where we did the South Korea hybrid wine tasting, uh, where uh, we worked with the embassy in South Korea, um, where we uh, yeah, um, leveraged a hotel conference room and South, South Korean importers attended in person and tasted the wines in person, while the South African wine exporters dialed in virtually, really walking them through the wine tasting from South Africa. Uh, West Coast European Desk, in collaboration with the EAP team, uh, built a custom platform to host Taste South Africa, where we connected Western Cape exporters in the food and beverage sector with Russian and uh, Eastern European importers. Um, and then uh, our last uh, exhibition was actually hosted on the 31st of March 2021. And that's where all the export desks worked together to host West Coast flagship export event, Cape Agri Week. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is where we hosted 80 exhibitors, six export councils, 201 buyers, which led to nearly 500 B2B meetings, and exporters reported that about a third of these meetings resulted in strong export leads. 
Um, yeah, and we're looking forward to see the results that will come out of this mission, particularly this year, as, as and when we start getting declarations in. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague Tofik, uh, head of the district's unit, to provide some example, examples of district unit and LED collaboration. Thank you very much, Erika, and uh, good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members. It's good to be here with you this morning. Um, as Tim mentioned, the, and just to pick up on what he mentioned around the district unit, since our inception, our role has really been around um, creating stronger links between Westro and municipalities, but I think equally important, if not more important, it's been to extend the reach of the Westgrove support services to businesses within the municipalities. And I, one of the first examples of that um, collaboration in pursuit of unlocking or helping businesses unlock their economic opportunity um, is a, a joint venture between the George Business Chamber and the George Municipality and the District Unit, where we hosted an intimate gathering of 20 businesses um, and from that, we recruited two investment projects. There were two leads for export promotion that was also recruited. Um, those companies since have participated in the export advancement program and have since undertaken the um, some virtual outward missions. Um, we were also quite instrumental in shaping the Garden Root Investor Prospectus, and we are now looking towards positioning that in strategic markets uh, globally and uh, domestically. And during the time of, uh, of lockdown, we, we promoted the Export Advancement Program as well as the Promote Mentorship via um, virtual platforms. We did so with um, some of the municipalities, not all of them, Cape Winelands and West Coast uh, in particular. And during these webinars, it also allowed the municipalities the opportunity to address a large, a fairly large segment of its business community at a time of, uh, of great uncertainty when gatherings were, were not permitted um, and, and to really um, provide some comfort to its local business community. Um, and then some of the export advancement programs that you heard about earlier on were specifically designed to support or um, provide the training to, to businesses within the within the districts. All five districts were covered, and this is as a result of the success looking towards rolling that out for, for the new year. And then we lastly hosted a six-month um, e-learning course. We came together, partnered with WavTech, a leading um, provider of investment and export promotion training. And the training was designed to towards upskilling the knowledge levels um, of LED officials on investment facilitation and export promotion so that we can better as a collective service the businesses within the municipalities. And I think from these collaborations, one of the indicators um, for the last year under review, for just looking at investment promotion, is that we've seen a greater spread of investments within the districts um, uh, since the inception of the, of the district unit. And I think that's uh, partly an indicator of um, the return on investment of these collaborations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Tufi. Um, is Ilsa online? Yes, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, Ilsa. Uh, Ilsa is here the best. At, on our last meeting, as you intro the last time, we were asked to just explain some of the issues we've been having. And I call it issues because they were really difficult issues of non-delivery and um, experiences that we've had, negative experiences we've had with the CAT CETA online system um, and with delays in issuing of certificates and so forth. And um, Ilse is going to give us a present, no, not a presentation, just a verbal feedback on how we've dealt with that and the meeting we've had with the CAT CETA. So over to you, um, Ilse, and Erica, you can un yeah, unshare your screen. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Chairperson. Just very shortly from our side, um, just as an update for from the questions last time. So we've reached out to CATSITA with regards to the, the, the delays we're experiencing with their new system. They've indicated that they've actually appointed an individual to assist uh, with regards to the Western Cape's applications to speed it up. They've um, provided feedback uh, via the National Tourist Guide Registrar that we need to give them six months to get up to date with regards to the, the, the backlog. 
it's mostly linked to the old um, the the guides that have already been registered in terms of their renewals and any changes that they are making. So they are going to have a special project to get that up to date. Um, they are also appointing a new regional manager um, for the Western Cape uh, just to act as a skills liaison officer to assist us because we've got about 5,000 guides, which is the most guides in the province. So that's um, set to happen as well in the next month. They'll confirm that that person has been appointed. And then um, just that we've noted on the provincial tourist registrar, um, the, just the, the meeting that takes place once in every quarter, that we'd like this to be a standing item until all matters have been resolved. So that's just a very short update from our side. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you. Ms. Albert, did you say six months? Yes, I did. <laughs> Chair person. Okay. That's, that's what they've asked for. <laughs> that's what they asked for. Okay. Yes. Colleagues, let us take um, a, a 15 minute break. No, not 15, it's 10 minutes break. And then we restart at 9.55, which is, which is actually two minutes extra. 9.55. Um, and then we're going to do questions and answers if, if everyone's okay with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Thanks.
now we're going to be dealing with questions and answers. I'm going to take the first round of questions, please. If members could please use the raise hand function accordingly. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay, member van der Westhuizen, are there any other hands? Okay, if none, member van der Westhuizen, and then I'll ask my questions after that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair, thank you very much uh, through you to all the presenters. And uh, we've really been witnessing some incredible stories, uh, success stories as well. And I'm really grateful uh, for that and particularly for the work that allowed us to, or allowed you to present such stories. I wonder if uh, I, I could just ask the department uh, they had a slide, unfortunately it wasn't numbered, but it, uh, the heading read Program Budget and Targets. And uh, when that slide was up, uh, we were told that, you know, that slide presents a budget of about 50 million rand, but that apparently they were able to leverage other funding, uh, and the word CETA also came up again, National Skills Fund, um, to the value of 105 million rand. And I'm just wondering whether we would be able to get a breakdown of what is the cost per learner. And I do know that this can also sometimes be quite misleading because, you know, um, a, a course can be as brief as a matter of hours, or it could be, uh, you know, adding up to 120 credits or being the equivalent of a full year's training, etc. Et but if you could just give us an indication of the cost efficiency of, of that training, I would really appreciate that, uh, Chair. And then if we go to the uh, Saldana Bay IED, uh, Economic Zone, then there was a page nine on their presentation uh, speaking of contractor development. And um, they, uh, they identified uh, a number of areas where, and I'm now going to use the word training, is needed, which I think is great. Uh, I, I, I love the, the saying which says you need to understand a problem before you can solve that problem. Now, one of the items mentioned there was the, the issue of contractors uh, struggling with uh, calculating a correct pricing. Now, I think that is an extremely important uh, topic and skill for contractors to be able to do that because uh, we've seen in this country too often uh, where, you know, contracts were awarded at either highly inflated prices, but just as uh, uh, damagingly is the whole issue of contractors coming in at too low a price and then they are not able to uh, build up a sustainable business. Uh, we often have uh, projects that are only half completed and then people need to go to the courts to set aside the uh, original bid. And then, you know, we've got these delays and there are damages and quite often the second bid or the second contractor comes in much higher. But perhaps if we could just get an indication, is it a general pricing issue or is it, uh, you know, to come in with uh, prices that are competitive? Uh, and, and if we could, you know, just learn a little bit more about that. And then lastly, Chair, and, and again, uh, this is not directed at any specific uh, presentation, but we've heard right here at the end again, uh, and I raised in our last meeting when we had it about the, the tourist guides uh, that, you know, Cath Sita uh, at the issuing of certificates uh, posed a problem and it seems to me, and thank you for immediately picking up on the fact that, you know, six months seem to be an, uh, quite a, a, a long time to fix things which should actually, in my mind, be quite easy to, to, to fix. Perhaps if you could just tell us how much uh, you know, what your experience has been with the other CETAs, because if the department was able to leverage 105 million rand from other CETAs, which were those CETAs? Um, 
what has been your experience and particularly and perhaps all the presenters could just tell us what have your experiences been uh, in 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 uh, uh, successful graduates uh, achieving or receiving their uh, certificates or, or proof of of their qualifications after they've completed those programs thank you chair Thank you so much. I don't see any other hands. Are there any other hands, members? Otherwise, I'm going to pose my questions now. Okay, if not, I'll pose my questions then. Um, for DDAT, I wanted to find out now that the BPO Academy was launched in November at the end of last year, um, I wanted to find out what is the application process, when do applications open, when do they close, and what is um, what is the recruitment process? How are you working with schools uh, uh, in the different municipalities or in the current municipality in order to attract the youth in order to apply to the BPO Academy to go and study there? That's the first one. And um, this one, I guess, is a little bit to, to everyone, but mostly to Saldana Bay IDZ. Um, I, I really want to congratulate them on the amount of beneficiaries in the various programs trained. Um, I think I've previously congratulated DDAT um, on their respective uh, uh, skills program. But uh, Saldana Bay, uh, the new information, uh, I wanted to congratulate you, but also I wanted to ask, is it possible to do a school's roadshow in, for example, the West Coast uh, area, but also in other districts with schools? Um, and this comes from my, my experience over the past two, three years of, uh, of assisting some of the matriculants in Langsburg to apply for university and, and TVET colleges. And I'm, I'm seeing the, the, the kids at the school again next week after school in order to help with applications. And I just wanted to find out because some, some of the schools in the rural areas don't necessarily have the same access to find out about some of these programs. And I do think if one, if one tries to, to throw the net out in order to have a general roadshow to, to showcase what students matriculants can apply for then um, then we will probably have more applications in in those regards for the asez uh, i also wanted to congratulate you i do know some of the programs already but uh, of the new the new information especially the akamva youth stem education program uh, congratulations on that that's amazing um, I do want to note the one slide where it spoke to no coding and ICT skills development initiatives. And I have two questions in that regard to Dr. Fuerges uh, from the ASEZ. Um, is it not possible to leverage some of the CETAs for the coding and ICT skill development initiatives, um, given that the ASEZ is interacting with three different spheres of government? And to Mr. Rashid Tufi from the department regarding the ASEZ, what would what would the budget look like? Uh, is it not possible to to leverage some of the budget for the ASEZ in order to to bring coding and ICT skills? I can only imagine that you when you have energy development, you need to have ICT development as well. It kind of goes a bit hand in hand, I think. And I think member member Van der Veste is in, uh, uh, raise the question I wanted to ask about the CAF CETA, but six months is too long. If if national government is asking for six months for a backlog, by that time we're going to have a new backlog. Six months is way too long. What what is going to be the solution to bring down six months to maybe three months, for example? What what is that solution going to be? Um, I do know we've previously resolved that not that we must now um, engage in all of the the respective CETAs and the involvement and, and collaboration with, with our province, especially within the economic economic sphere, um, which we've previously resolved, but in gen but in specifically for the CAF CETA, uh, we need to we need to come up with a solution. And Ms. Van Skalkwe, what is the solution to bring that six months down to perhaps three months? Because we cannot wait that long, especially if you're saying that the Western Cape has the most tourist guides um, in the country. Uh, please. Uh, I see Member Nkondlo's hand. You may go ahead. Thank you.
Member on court law, remember to unmute. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, everybody. Um, my questions, if I'm audible, um, one, I think to the BPO uh, team, uh, I just want to understand uh, what is the current uh, reach of the participants? Um, is it... Uh, I've unmuted. Hello? Yes, Member Nkondlo, we can hear Hello. you. Hello? Member Nkondlo, we can hear you. Can you hear me, Chairperson? Yes, Member Nkondlo, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, Ms. Adams, um, could you perhaps just um, contact Member Nkondlo? I think we can hear her, but she can't hear us. We'll do, Chairperson. Also, just type you on the, on the chat also. Just for those who can't see the chat, I'm just letting Member Mkondo quickly know that we can hear her. I'm just asking if she can hear us. But if IT um, can also just check in with her, please. Okay, Member Mkondo says she can hear us. Member Mkondo, you may go ahead. Okay, if I may, if I may proceed, uh, Chairperson. Um, my first question was to the BPO team. Um, I wanted to check. I wanted to check um, if um, the EPF is participating in BPO projects. Is it more metro bias, or um, is it able to reach um, those that are in the non-metro? If so, what are the percentages uh, thereof? What are the percentages thereof? Uh, secondly, um, also in terms of the work skills uh, budget, I saw that uh, the presentation indicates that it was uh, reduced. Um, I just want to understand what would have been the cause and the impact uh, thereof. Uh, I'm assuming, and please correct me, uh, um, if the work skills um, a, a, a project is a placement from the training to the placement so that's why I'm asking if it was what was was reduced why and what would it what would be its impact then to pipeline those that have been trained into you know um, uh, official uh, uh, employment and uh, lastly the do you know if you do have that information of what salary ranges are we talking about when people are in the full employment in terms of the PPO sector in general and then uh, in terms of the West Group presentation, um, Chair, I just wanted to check whether the current participating um, um, municipalities is Cape Winelands and George. Um, I might have lost it uh, in terms of my connectivity. Pardon me if that is the case, um, uh, because I want to understand what's the process of municipalities or how do you select municipalities to participate um, uh, in the programs that you have already in your LED collaboration at this at this point is there a particular criteria um, in a particular year where you make a decision about which municipalities you would be working with um, if you can uh, please give me that indication and in terms of that LED collaboration what is the what is the funding uh, sources for such uh, programs, um, who, uh, is it um, uh, the municipalities? Do they have any budget to support the program? How does it work just from a funding uh, uh, point of view? And then um, I think my last one is on the uh, uh, is on the uh, the IDZ. Um, I think uh, one both the uh, Saldana and the Atlantis. One, I think, is impressed with the current work that is being done, especially on the developmental initiatives. Um, I understand that Atlantis might be very in, in its early stages uh, of their initiatives, and the, 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 the Saldana um, may be a bit um, advanced. I just want to check whether both um, are they engaging the um, uh, the FET College, which is the um, West Coast uh, College, uh, in harmonizing the skills development that is being done by both themselves, by both of these entities, wherein you already also have these institutions of higher learning in that same space. 
Number two, um, how uh, I saw, I think, the Saldana does have the program with the WCET, because I remember in the previous uh, administration, one of the problems for them to undertake their skills program was the, um, the pool from the, um, the secondary schools. So I see that uh, Saldana is doing, uh, IDZ is doing something in that regard, which I'm assuming, and please they can and confirm which that is going to be helping to improve uh, mathematics and physical um, uh, output of the learners in those schools, which then would enable them to participate in some of their programs. And um, in Atlantis, uh, how are you dealing with that? Because I saw also in the presentation you mentioned some of the challenges of IT uh, base uh, uh, understanding uh, in the in the in the areas uh, there. So I'm asking, how are you engaging uh, the schools in the area also to improve um, uh, learning in those particular um, uh, uh, subjects? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Nkondlo, Member Maseko. Thank you, Chair. I should have dropped my hand because Member Nkondlo covered my question with the engagement of the FET. Let me just, I think, uh, use the opportunity to find out something. I think in the last administration, one of the challenges, it was the, the drug abuse that when they got the kids, immediately when they test them, they test them, they'll find that they test positive to um, the drug usage. Are they still doing that as they do the intake? Or to what an extent does that um, affect the numbers that they they would want to, to achieve when they check those kids. And another concern maybe, or the question it will be, to what an extent does the um, Saldana IDZ or the department itself, not Saldana IDZ, engage the basic education department, seeing that we have such a high percentage of the youth that, um, or the population that doesn't have the metric. Yes, I do understand that the FET is the standard nine, but with what I've seen also, um, they there are a lot of youth that I haven't passed the grade nine, not the standard nine, the grade nine. Now, to what an extent is the department engaging the department of the basic education in as a supplier to the skills development in, in dealing with the unemployment, notwithstanding the issue of that um, we, I think the province is doing well with the um, employment, but there's still a lot of kids in the rurals because one thing that maybe we have to find out is the percentage of the kids that are coming from the metro versus the ones in the rurals to see what percentage does are we feeding the places like Saldana IDZ or the Atlantis IDZ to see how are we doing in getting the rural kids to also have a share in the employment within this um, economic um, forms? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Maseko. Member Van der Veer I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Chair. If I may link on to Honorable Kondlo's question regarding the typical salaries in the BPO um, offshore uh, uh, environment, uh, perhaps if they could also just tell us how are those uh, people remunerated? Is it an hourly wage? Is it uh, full-time employment? Is it uh, performance uh, linked? Uh, if, if they could just expand and tell us a little bit more than just your typical salary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Mr. Tufi, as you can see, the members of this committee is very passionate about skills, development and education. Um, and education, skills and development goes hand in hand with jobs. And I said this to the Agriculture Department yesterday on oversight at Alsenberg between their research unit, innovation unit, and their, and their college principal, that they must be hashtag besties. And the same with DDAT and the respective entities and the department, the uh, Western Cape Department of Basic Education must be hashtag besties. Because how do we get those youth from our schools into these programs? How do we ensure that we expand upon the skills, the development and education 
of the residents of the Western Cape. I will allow you to allocate the questions for us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, this is the exciting part. This is the sort of sharp end of our, I, I feel like of our job, you know, the, the bit that feels like it's really making an impact. So I think a lot of the questions are quite self-explanatory as to who must answer them. So Nizam, I'm assuming you will be on standby, please, to answer the questions. Question number one from Honorable Member van der Westezen, as well as the one about the other seaters. I think you've had a lot of experience with other seaters and the, the success we've had. Um, and then, of course, the BPO question about the processing. So that was question number four. And, and if you could, when you answer first, Nizam, just pick up on then the, the other BPO question from Member Nkondlo, number eight, and then the, the follow-up question from um, Member van der Westezen. And then perhaps secondly, we could go to the Akashifa and your team. If you want to pick up on Member van der Westezen's first question, the one, the second question, the one about the contractors and the pricing and so forth. And then, of course, the issue of the road shows will also be you, um, Kashifa and team, and, and the matter of your engagement with the basic education. And then perhaps we could go thirdly to Saldana, I mean, to Atlantis SEZ, peer and team, and then Westcrow. Yao, I know that Tim has stepped away. Yao, if you could do a sweeping role and pick up on that matter that was addressed to, to Westcrow about the municipalities and how they participate, you know? So let, let me, if that's okay as a, as a broad allocation, I'll, I'll do a bit of a sweep at the end and make sure that we've covered all of them. So um, Nizam, over to you to answer that, the ones that were allocated for you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid, and thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the questions posed by the members. So the first question is um, sort of the cost per job. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at the, our budget of 50 million, and then we had about, I think it's 4,100 or so um, opportunities created. Um, so that would then translate to a 12,039 rand budget for the department in creating a job, which is exceptionally low. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's crea has created any organization, created a job quite at that price. But even if you take in the crowded funds, the cost per job is 36,000 rand per job, again, which is exceptionally low. It's also important to understand how that money is made up of. When we place those learners, those beneficiaries with companies, we ask companies to support skills development. So they will provide seat accreditation, vendors accreditation, and they will top up on the, the funding, on, on our funding. And that's typically how that 36,000 rand is created. But we've received money from MERS CETA, from the transport CETA. Um, there's crowded in money from the NSF in support of the program. So that's with respect to sort of the cost um, um, per, per job. There was a question also around the geographical spread. Um, we, we are a very demand-led um, member. And it's really where um, where those companies are resided, and the bulk of them are in the metro. Um, we've, um, but it's not only in the CBD. It's uh, we expanding to areas like Athlone, um, where more and more BPO companies are moving towards. And then we've recently facilitated investment out or in the process of facilitating investment out in the Garden Route, which is uh, another large BPO investment in the Garden Route. Obviously, you, you do require scale. Um, a BPO is not going to move to an area if they can't uh, grow up to, say, 500, 1,000 or so jobs, and they are looking for a very specific type of, um, type of individual uh, to, to um, support the international um, jobs. Um, the question around um, CETAs. Um, our engagement with CETAs in the main has not been very challenging. Um, the, the problem is particularly with private sector and some other partners is the requirements by the CETAs are quite high. They do look for crowded in funds and very often Mr. Joseph, you have frozen on my screen. I'm not sure if you've frozen on other people's screens. Uh, Mr. Yes. Tufi? 
Yes, um, yes he... particularly on... Nizam, Nizam, just we, you seem to be frozen yeah. on the screen. Maybe, Sorry, I'm... maybe you could unshare oh, camera okay, and just go back about okay, 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, great, uh, thanks. So the, the other challenge is the first challenge was obviously the requirement for funding. Um, and the, the, the second requirement is particularly one around around who can host individuals as companies. So very often there is legislation and regulation where one tradesperson could only have uh, uh, one to three um, um, candidates that they would typically provide mentoring on. That's particularly some of the artisanal um, trades. So it does create a constraint at the company with extent to uh, the number of candidates that a company can take on. Now, obviously, that's very, very challenging, um, particularly for, for, for companies, because they want to take on more candidates, but, but they can't. With respect to the recruitment process, um, we, we are demand-led, right? So we don't, government does not recruit. Uh, we, I think that we do a particularly poor job at recruiting uh, for a number of reasons. There's technical skills at a company, would require the soft skills, there's behavioral skills and everything else. And if, if, if government recruits and places those candidates at firms, it does not fear on the company, it's not fair on the on the individual either, because there may be some mismatch between the individual and the company, and they may be better suited at another company. So we, um, uh, we, we insist that firms do the recruitment. We obviously provide the criteria that the individual um, in most cases, must be a youth, they must be unemployed, they must not have worked for a particular company before, they must not be, um, um, they must not be, uh, there must not be any sort of um, family relationship between the individual and, and the directors. And we've got a, a criteria by, by which, uh, for which the company need to adhere to in, in, in when they do recruit. Um, there was a question, just created a demand, uh, yeah, so um, a question around how these individuals um, get paid. Um, that's, a, that's a really important question, um, and it's important to note the type of jobs that we typically support, or the companies, when we say offshore jobs, these are jobs that services the offshore market, and they typically inbound calls. Um, you do get the call centers where um, you would sell cell phones or policies or those type of things. So we typically um, don't support those jobs. The bulk of our jobs, 90% of our jobs, would be international offshores. In fact, can't seem to think of any, very few companies that would service a domestic market. And the domestic market really are those companies that typically will sell products. So um, it's, there's very little commission involved. So our contribution is between, in fact, we um, most of our pro programs in the BPO is not 3,000 rand, it's actually 2,500 rand. But then while those candidates, beneficiaries are on the program in the experiential learning component, we've got firms that pays up, up to 6,000 rand a month um, while they're on the experiential, so they more than double our contribution. And when those candidates are given um, full-time employment, um, subsequent the um, experiential intervention, those salaries can go up between 10 to 15,000 um, rand. Um, uh, there was a question on engagement with Western Cape Education Department. We have a few. Um, 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 one is uh, um, it's an at-home learning program, which is a collaboration uh, with them where we uh, look at getting those young kids that dropped out of school back into the school system. And there we affected about a thousand of those uh, uh, individuals um, last year. And then we're also looking at um, embedding in higher education grade 9, 10, 11, and 12, embed a skill such as artisanal skill, a software development skill in the educational system. So when kids graduate from um, um, uh, uh, with a matric, They've got a skill that they can either easily then transition into a TVIT or place them into, into a, a firm. Um, I think that was all that was, oh yeah, there was one last one was, uh, um, what is, what's the, the, the budget, why was the budget cut and uh, the impact of that budget cut? Um, 
think, member, I think that um, it, I think it's no secret that um, every province and every national department probably receives some type of uh, budgetary cuts. There's certain um, and there's certain uh, departments like education and health where where the depart where the provincial government would have a a legislative mandate uh, to support um, um, those departments. Um, and unfortunately, this was one of the, mm. we were one of the, the projects uh, that, that received some cut uh, in budget. We will try to make it up as, as best we can through leveraging um, external funds um, that will soften some of that blow. Uh, but you asked for the impact. So um, if, if it, uh, last year the jobs were 12,000 rand each, we expect a job, an average cost of a job is probably around about 20 and not 12. Last year was a very specific, uh, at very specific circumstances. So um, if there's a budget cut of 14 million um, and uh, um, 14 million and it costs about 20,000 rand to create a job, it means that the, the, the impact would be around about 700 um, uh, youth that we less that we would be able to support um, in the current financial year in, in facilitating employment for them. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Nizam. I, I feel like you've covered those. Uh, Nizam, can I ask you just a one question? Um, Minister, um, Member Van der Veste has asked about the, you know, the budget of 50,000 plus the 100 million, I mean, 50 million plus the 100 million leveraged. I mean, that that wasn't a mistake, Member Van der Veste, and that is, in fact, the scale of money we've leveraged. Do, do you want to give us some idea of how, how many individuals, you know, how many individuals does that extra leveraged 100 million cover? I, I feel like that was the specific question. Could you perhaps answer that? And then, I, Bianca, perhaps you could pick up just, I didn't mention it earlier, but if you could pick up the question, the similar question about budget with respect to um, the Atlantis um, SEZ. But Nizam, first to you. Okay, thank you for that, Rashid. Um, so, yes, uh, um, members, so uh, we had a target of 1,500 beneficiaries supported, um, and we've obviously managed to uh, support uh, 4,100. Um, now, some of, some of that is explained by the cost of the job was reduced, um, and that's why we could, we could uh, um, support more candidates. But a lot of that was also because of the funding we leveraged. So if you look at the gap between 1,500 and 4,100, um, that is the, the, the net effect of, those, uh, of the additional funds that we leverage. But it's not only that, uh, Chairperson. Um, it's also the quality that we provide. When we leverage funds, we can develop skills programs. Now, the department does not have, we, we've not, we don't have a skills program. We take our money and we leverage external funds for those skills development initiatives. Um, so when there's, when there's a decline in our budget, it means that we, 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 um, we, we can't leverage as much external funds because our funds must be used to leverage external funds. But in short, Rashid, it's the gap between the target of 1,500 and um, what we delivered, which was 4,100, which explains uh, that other funds that was leveraged. Thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Nizam. I hope that covers that one. And Bianca, do you want to quickly address that matter, the matter of the budget? And then I'll go to Saldana SEZ, as I said. Um, Saldana IDZ, yeah? Thank you, Rashid. Um, I think that DDAP would love nothing better than to fund all of the programs of all of our projects, of all of our interventions, especially from SBIDZ, SEZ, and Westgrove. Unfortunately, um, as the committee well knows, this has been an exceptionally fiscally constrained year. Um, and the SEZ, uh, to, form, to finalize its establishment, has a very big uh, budget ticket item this year, which is the land transaction, and it is one of the almost the final step in, in establishing an SEZ. And unfortunately, in light of those budget requirements, uh, DDAT could not make any uh, further funding available that could support, for example, the coding skills program. We do, however, continue to work with SEZ and with our partners to find suitable funding. And possibly later on in the year, maybe we're very lucky and Ellen manages to raise the funding from somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. And now um, perhaps I'll go to um, Kashifa. And if you could pick up the questions which were addressed to you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rashid. 
Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Patrick to answer uh, Honourable Member van der Pesto, isn't there questions on um, the general issue when it comes to pricing uh, and, and uh, whether it comes in as, as com competitive? Second question of which CETAs fund us. Uh, third question of our experience with our learners receiving certificates from CETAs. I will then answer the question or try to answer the question on um, the chairs on, on, on schools road, roadshow. And on uh, Member Encontro's question on um, the FET college uh, relationship, Patrick can also answer, the, answer that. <clears throat> Sorry. And also uh, the second one on the, the improving the maths and physical science outcomes from the high school program. Uh, Danielle can uh, answer that. Um, yeah, I think uh, the question on the Western Cape Education Department, you, you will see in our responses the, the level of engagement that, that we have there. But I don't see any questions specifically from Member Maseko's questions uh, to us. So, Patrick, if you can start, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, um, on uh, Honorable Van der Vestesen's question, yes, um, it is specific. Uh, it is not a general uh, uh, pricing uh, challenge that we had, but that we actually detected with our subcontractors. In fact, um, what happened is when we started with our infrastructure project, there was this uh, divide between Cape Town-based suppliers and Sardana-based suppliers. And we noticed that the Cape Town-based suppliers were generally uh, very much competitive when it comes to pricing, whether it was labor, material, and also markup, and obviously uh, your, your PCNGs. Uh, we then started with intervention. Compatibility with regards to labor. Uh, then recently picked up that uh, costing was the cost and supply costing. Um, Mr. Lakabane, you're cutting out. Apologies for interrupting. You're cutting out a little bit. Is it possible, perhaps, to just deactivate your video so that we are able to just uh, hear you a bit better, please? It's a wonderful background, but uh, we we would like to hear the answers. Mr. Lakebani, are you still with us? Uh, Jay, I, I think they, they might be an issue with his connection, but I can I can answer. I don't want to hold up. So the the challenge that uh, um, the local SMEs have uh, that we've identified is that it's with buying power power, power on scale. Um, also, the capacity to negotiate discounts on material pricing with with suppliers and um, we would say that labor charges are comparative um, because there are obviously um, labor bargaining council uh, regulation around that. So we don't, yeah, I see he's, he's, he dropped off. Um, so, so what we're doing in the pricing then is really to capacitate, it's about supporting the, uh, the, the local contractors with knowledge and awareness to improve the negotiating power. We don't really, we, you know, uh, as as the client, we cannot. We also have to be quite careful in our role in terms of buying power for scale because it's it's not, it, you know, th there is a there is a scope of the works in the contract, and because of public procurement, uh, we cannot uh, uh, make it seem as if there's a prom promise for further work to the next contract because each individual contract needs to be assessed on its own merits, of, of course. Um, on the question of uh, which CETAs have funded us, so so um, that is MERCETA, the chemical CETA, and the local government CETA up to now. Um, we Patrick has sent me a message and said that uh, we have no challenges with uh, um, getting our learners receiving certificates from the CETAs once they've completed the, um, their training. Um, yeah, so then on the, Yeah, Patrick, are you back? Sorry, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> of no, I, I answered. You, you answered, which question did you answer? I, I've, I've answered them so far. Okay. Mr. Lakabani, my advice is that uh, even though you have a wonderful background, that you just keep your video off for now so that we are able to oh. just hear, <laughs> hear all I the did, information. I did, I did too. 
Chair, just, 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 just to add quickly, uh, with regards to the TVET college that Honorable Nkonza uh, asked. In fact, yesterday we we uh, we set up a meeting with the TVET college uh, because we want to sign an MOU with them on the newly established entrepreneurial uh, uh, skill center that they that, that they just opened to to look at, at areas where we can collaborate. Because what we are saying is we creating the demand through the zone. And from their side, they will create uh, the supply. So that is one of the areas of collaboration. And we've also just recently, in fact, last week, we've, uh, we are now going to appoint the TVET College to deliver on 20, I'm not, I'm talking on a correction, but I think it's 20 uh, electrical uh, 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 training programs that we receive funding from, from the CETA. So the collaboration with the TVET College is a standing one that has been happening uh, for quite a while. And then also, just to add on, maybe Kashi, if I didn't touch this, on Honorable Van der Westhuizen's um, question on people coming in too low or sometimes too high. Um, so what we have done is with our main contractors agreed to have a, a, a where prices are below 15% of the budget, uh, they would automatically fall out, but we will go back to those companies, you know, and talk to them and, and see where they were too low and where there's 15% a bit uh, too high, uh, they would also fall, fall out. So we have that big, that, that buffer that we put there, 15% too low, we see you as a risk to the project, you might run uh, uh, without money, and then we have to point someone else. 15% too high above budget, then also we don't uh, uh, engage with, with that particular company. So yeah, that is, those are the, the, the just to add on what Kashiba answered. And then on certificates, Chair, um, we, we had, Challenges in the past. Construction CETA, for instance, was one CETA where we actually almost waited for a year for our certificates. Uh, we couldn't solve that problem. Uh, it forced us in 2016 to decide not to not to not to deliver on projects with a construction CETA anymore because it is totally unacceptable to wait that long for certificates. In fact, that problem is hasn't hasn't been resolved. Hence, you will see that when we report. We don't report in any interventions or funding that we receive from construction center due to that persisting pro, uh, pro, pro, uh, problem or challenge with certificates. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Patrick. If I may continue, Chair, uh, on your question of the uh, road shows across with, with other schools outside of the um, municipal area, this is a difficult one to answer uh, because um, we, because of COVID and um, uh, the remote learning uh, approach that had to be adopted, uh, we still haven't yet had our own roadshow with, with the nine schools uh, across Aldana that we've done the work with. So we have had sessions with the teachers and the principals, but not yet with the learners. And we are being advised by the Western Cape Education Department and the West Coast District as to when we can start that activity. Um, so I I, I, I I do understand your question and where it comes from, and I agree to the principle of it, but practically we haven't been able to uh, go into the, the schools that we've targeted inside the municipality. So I think we first need to address that before we, and, and work with the Department of Education in that regard uh, if we do further outshows. Um, my apologies, um, Member Maseko did have a question on drug abuse, um, and and with like as it was highlighted as a, a challenge in the, in the previous administration, and she asked if does this still affect our outcomes? Um, Patrick, do you want to answer that one, please? Yes, yes, Chair. So, Chair, uh, one of the first things that we did was to 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 acknowledge that drug abuse, substance abuse, or any any of the social ills might impact negatively on our programs. And the particular one, the one that was persisting was, was drug abuse in the form of TIC. Um, uh, we then, we then uh, said initially that uh, we would do TIC, sorry, we would do drug tests, and those that found to be positive would not be allowed in the programs. But then when we, when we further investigated that option, we then said, but it's not going to help because the only thing we're gonna do is just to prevent people that might want a second chance in life not to be, you know, not to participate meaningfully in our in our development programs. Yeah. 
because we believe that should we detect you, uh, we must refer you to rehab or, or, or give you assistance, you know, to get rid of, 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 of the challenge that we have. Now, because we didn't have the funding, therefore, nor the expertise or the resources thereof, we then decided not to do drug tests on learners around here. Um, and, and, and rather, you know, um, when we detect the problem to engage with the, the, with, the, with the minimum resources that we had, we did sign, however, a MOU with the Department of Social Development where they are assisting us with uh, where, where, where we detect these problems. Um, so that is the alternative that we've actually put in place is the assistance that we received from the Department of Social Development to assist us with areas where we, det we detect any social abuse. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Chair, I think we're all done now. Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, I want to also apologize. I forgot to let Westro go first because they have a, a important meeting with a big company also coming up today. So what I'm going to do is after Westro has answered their respective questions, I will do their follow-ups first then, if, if that's okay with everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. So uh, let's let's go to Atlantis SEZ. So, um, Pierre, will you will you take some of the questions which were addressed to you? Um, yes, um, I will address the funding issue. I'll ask Ellen to address the questions uh, put by uh, Member Van der State and also the Chair. And after that, I just want to comment on uh, the funding matter that also raised across the board all the questions. So with regards to the questions around um, uh, the experience um, of um, graduates receiving their certificates, so um, our programs have only been running just over a year, um, but we are already experiencing the delays. We do see that for those that um, finished programs last year, um, companies do ask, especially because I would say that there's um, uh, you know, not an academic level of education, but more artisanal skills and apprenticeships. So it, it makes a huge difference in the time that graduates can actually apply for jobs and, and get into market. Um, it does impact very negatively the delay. Um, and at the same time, also the, the accredited um, courses are, are very important. I, I personally sometimes wonder about that um, because of the fact that um, they're expensive um, to get the accredited courses and people usually also want multiple um, courses to get for degrees, but um, yeah, that's quite difficult um, to look at our mandate and funding uh, through Brunari University or uh, training college. Um, speaking about colleges, going to the question about whether we are engaging with the West Coast um, College, so we have a very strong um, relationship with them, yes. Um, we, um, they support us in uh, providing venues, which has been very difficult in the past year, um, and the technical facilities um, that we need for some of the technical training. Also, one of our community stakeholder network uh, members is actually a senior lecturer from the West Coast uh, College. So uh, we have um, direct access to potential opportunities that they are offering, and that's also how we leverage our partnerships. But at the same time, uh, where we're looking at um, uh, using, for example, uh, as part of our procurement uh, process, or let me say terms of, of, and, and conditions, is that uh, technical, uh, or let's say engineers um, that do work for the ACZ actually include uh, a number of interns. So that in turn assists the West Coast College and specifically, of course, the learners from Atlantis to have access to these um, you know, architectural and engineering and mechanical engineering um, work placements and internships that they normally wouldn't have. So, um, yes, we are very much engaging with the West Coast College. With regards to the question um, about, um, you know, what our outreach is uh, in the north to the um, economic zones. So, uh, in, in part of our recruitment, or a, a part of our recruitment, ensuring that we reach um, the Greater Atlantis area, which includes uh, the Bit Sands location, uh, Monda and Pella, and we can actually access those different communities because of the community stakeholder network. So we engage directly with the leaders and they actually disseminate um, through WhatsApp, but through emails and through physical meetings where we actually um, go to these different um, 
locations and, and, and share the opportunities. And also when we recruit, we look at um, percentages and representation, uh, gender, but also, of course, um, yeah, ethnicity. And we also report back. The CSN also keeps us in check in terms of ensuring that we have a proper representation. Um, just I would like to comment on a question around uh, drug abuse. So uh, drug abuse and, and, it's, and especially tech is also a huge problem um, here in um, Atlantis. And so one of the aspects of the Living Lab in the partnership with UWC is actually having, um, so we have their Department of Social Work and Community Development who will work uh, with us and what we're offering them is an opportunity for them to uh, trial green social work which is a new element of, of social work studies and being introduced at UWC in, in their new curriculum and so it's um, so we have that kind of direct support and also through partnership with the city of Cape Town um, uh, working with social development. I think I have answered um, the questions then. Yeah. Sure, just a, a quick uh, response on the on the funding matter. I think one needs to be brutally honest and say that uh, the fiscus in the province is on the huge strain, and I think that an exponential growth in funding coming from the provincial fiscus for training and skill development is probably going to be unlikely. So we'll have to find that funding somewhere else because training people in Atlantis and getting them access to a job is simply not negotiable. That is an absolute must as part of the SNS going forward. But we need to find that funding now in other partnerships. And that's why the city of Cape Town is important. Uh, the city needs to come more and more to the party around the funding of these of these programs. And also our relationships with universities are becoming more important and putting in more proposals to the different CETAs to squeeze more money out of them. But again, they will also be under, under fiscal strain going forward. The last idea I want to move, and I've discussed already with the five investors in the in the FCD, that every lease agreement we sign with an investor must include a very small stipulation that a small percentage of turnover must go into a corporate social investment fund. It could be managed by the CSN, it could be managed by the SZ company, and for those monies to be applied to training. So money should not only come from government, it should also come from those investors that we sign lease agreements with. And we've included it already in the draft term sheets to the investor we have applied money for in terms of job structure. That system chair was very, very effectively applied in the gambling industry with the Western Cape Gambling Board over time from my days many years ago, actually stipulated that a small percentage of 0.015% of gross gaming revenue, which is basically turnover, must be going into a local trust managed by that trust. And one finds chair that the most of those monies are normally going into extra classrooms, computer rooms, and that kind of thing. And we hope. And uh, we've discussed already with the present investors, that's not a popular a popular comment or request, but um, I think one must just push the envelope more and more, that if the government comes up with a training budget, then the investors and the SED must come up with similar money going forward. Uh, just a seed I want to plant, and I hope it's not a non-popular seed I'm planting. Thank you, Pierre and team. I appreciate it. You, I think you've covered all those questions. And I'll, I'll now go to Westcrow. Yao, Yao, or your, your municipal team, do you want to just address that question of how we process um, or how municipalities can participate in your programs? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rashid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we have no real preferences in terms of um, who we work with in terms in, in the municipalities. Um, I just want to highlight the fact that it's a two-man team at the moment. Sorry, my camera. It's a two-man team at the moment. So we we choose to use the district approach, which I think is adopted by national as well. Um, we work with individual municipalities if they so wish, um, based on their specific needs. And then if it's something bespoke that we need to to do for them or deliver on with them, um, we work on a on a partnership agreement of some sort. Um, we. I suppose I mean, with most dark clouds, if, if there's a silver lining, if you look if you look for it, and the silver lining that COVID offered us this year was the ability to um, reach out to more municipalities more often, because normally we'd have to hit the road and drive for hours at, at some at some point uh, in some in some instances. So 
with COVID, we were able to set up regular meetings with, with the municipalities. We told them what our plans were. They told us what their plans were. And also, we were able to deliver those EAPs at a fraction of the cost of, of having a physical one. And as Erica mentioned, we were able to meet or, or meet with some of the smaller companies that would otherwise not have been able to, to attend. We funded those ourselves because we could reprioritize some of our budgets to cater for this. And also, we needed to be in a situation where we could have the municipalities getting a better understanding of what investment promotion does and means and that kind of thing. So we had a couple of webinars in some of the municipalities, but the EAPs were all were held with all the municipalities, I think, bar the, the central Kuru, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason for that was because they just didn't have the, the take up um, to, 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 to justify um, their own specific one. Um, I think I've answered the question. I hope. I think you, I think you have, Yao. Thank you very much. I think you got that. Thank you. And then lastly, Ilsa, do you want to just, I mean, I, I personally feel the, the six month delay is, is also not acceptable. And I, uh, Ilsa, I assume you already in your meeting have had, are planning a follow up meeting to address that matter. But we certainly, our, our approach here to making it easier to get things done is that we, we don't just accept such an unacceptable deadline and we, we push it and we nudge it. So what are you doing from your side, Ilsa, to address that six-month matter? Uh, thank you, Rashida. Thank you, Chairperson, for the for the uh, question. So or the follow-up. We have engaged with the National Tourism Registrar, uh, Urveshni Pillay, with, with regarding this. And we're setting up um, at least every month an update to see how far are they with capturing the backlog. Um, and once they've appointed the Western Cape liaison, then it'll be much easier for our acting tourism registrar to actually then engage with them to get uh, whatever we need to do to assist them because it's holding up the process of getting people registered um, because of the we can't verify the details on Catheter's database. So it's a massive concern for us and it's it's um, we agree with regards to the six month process, it's not feasible and we will work on them constantly to get it um, updated. And if we can assist in any any way, we will do so. But currently it's, we're really pushing it through NDT and the National Registrar as a STEM mandate to make sure that this works because that's what the role is of CATHCETA relating to this particular program. Thank you, Elsa. And if you need to escalate it to the minister to write to the any national minister, whether it's labor or tourism, then let us know, yeah? We, we will um, do. Jefferson, I'm going to hand back to you if there's another round of questions. I think we covered them all. Um, thank you, Mr. Tiffy. I am going to open up for a round of follow-ups and new questions. And I'm going to start with Westgro questions and follow-ups to Westgro. But just on that last point, we must not wait for it to be escalated before it goes to the minister to write to the national minister. Six months is unacceptable. And quite frankly, the minister must now write to the national minister to ask that it gets fast-tracked. But also, we must also then, as a committee, get monthly reports on this matter, please. It cannot be that these that the CAFCETA is there's a six month delay in the backlog. It must be solved every month. And the respective departments and entities that are having these problems with the CETAs, when we have the briefing on the CETAs, you must somehow all be in the meeting because we must now hear that Saldana is still having a problem with the construction CETA. And this then speaks to what are the other problems with CETAs across our different departments. But it is unacceptable. It must already be escalated to the minister. We can't wait. But colleagues, please, if you have follow-up questions, and please, can we please prioritize our WESCRO ones? Uh, because they have, a, they have a meeting with a big company a little bit later, and I would like to excuse them first. Uh, Member Father Vestasen, I see your hand. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. On the topic of training, uh, my impression is that for quality training to take place, you need uh, trainers with both the, the, the technical skills the ones that you want to convey or that uh, the knowledge that you want to, to to transfer to your learners. But secondly, you also need the uh, educational uh, abilities. You know, the, you need to be a good trainer uh, with good didactics and so on in order to be able to, to train. Then we also uh, need, in many cases, the necessary... Uh, uh, equipment, because, you know, you need, uh, in, in this case, I think a lot of hands-on training 
when it comes to, say, for example, uh, artisans or, you know, other uh, people that are going to work in call centers, etc. Et and my question is just to what extent can we support the trainers or support the training institutions uh, for them to develop good training material, to invest in equipment, and to know that there is going to be a pipeline for the next, for the foreseeable future, so that they can appoint and recruit good trainers uh, for you know the students that we that we intend to uh, then uh, uh, allow to benefit from from this training. So my question is actually, you know, how can we improve the quality? of training and and as you would know chair coming uh, or, or serving a, a rural community uh, you know it's not often to have a sustainable uh, economy of scale in terms of the number of learners that you can provide to such a training institution so that they in turn can invest uh, in the development of training material appointment of 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 uh, lecturers if i can use that word etc et so perhaps uh, uh, to our uh, uh, the people that we've invited today, uh, what is your impression of the quality of the training and how can we improve uh, even further then on the quality of that training in order to ensure that our youth uh, will have that competitive benefit when it, when it comes to uh, people looking for skilled people? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if that is directed to Wesco. It sounds like it's directed to the other entities and the department. But um, are there any other hands specifically for Wesco right now? Okay. If there are no other hands for Wesco, I because I would like to I would like the department to to go and not the department the entity to to go and attend to the other meeting as well. So I'm going to allow last opportunity for follow-ups to Wesco. Okay, there are none. Westgro, uh, CEO Harris, thank you so much and your team for being here with us today. Um, with that, I'm going to now excuse you from the meeting, but please continue with the wonderful work that you are doing. And please also just remember that the Western Cape is also bigger than the city of Cape Town. But thank you so much. Uh, Madam nice. Chair, I remind them every day. Ah, wonderful, Mr. Hendricks. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, much, Madam Chair, and all the members. Thanks, Thank Mr. Prince. All the wonderful backgrounds as well. Okay. Colleagues, with that, I'm going to now allow for extra follow ups to the other entities and departments. I'll do mine last. Okay. If none, then I'll put my follow ups now. Okay. Let's see your picture. In terms of uh, Mr. Mr. Joseph, we spoke about the 14 million rand budget cut, um, obviously, and the impact that uh, could have on on jobs that uh, that that you could not leverage, even though you have already exceeded the target actually based on the amount leverage. 14 million rand is not that much, and the department and the respective entities, and perhaps you need to also then engage uh, Atlantis. You, you are simply going to need to come up with a plan on how to leverage funding from various different sources in order to, to do the skills training that you need in order to for the, the SEZ as well as the IDZ to, to be able to flourish. Um, it's really not that much money, 14 million rand. So it's, it's simply a matter of sitting down, putting needs together, brainstorming, and then coming up with a plan regarding leveraging more funding in this regard. If you could leverage 105 million rand, then I am sure you can leverage 129 million rand, which is just a 14 million rand increase. Um, in terms of the construction seat, okay, I've mentioned that before, that we, please, if the entities, then when we have the CETAs before us can also then be present so that they can also hear from you directly the problems that you are having so that it's not just us telling them about the problems that you have. That would be wonderful, please. 
Um, in terms of the remote learning that uh, Ms. Birkes uh, Saldana Bay uh, indicated for the roadshows, remote with the teachers and the principals, um, is it possible for you to have an online roadshow? Because I'm sure that if, if schools, perhaps if the children are at school, if they are one, if they are physically at school, then perhaps they can use their school halls where there are school halls to, to do online a roadshow perhaps, because if the children are already at school, that might be a bit easier of a, of a solution. Or perhaps through some of the classrooms after school, maybe online, you can have a session with some of the learners uh, or students in order to tell them more about the, the, the upcoming plans. Um, could you please just indicate the feasibility about that? Um, let me just see here. And then, yes, and I think I already asked Ms. Van Skaltveig regarding the CAFCETA and the delays. Um, I, I would like it, quite frankly, to be escalated to the minister already to write to the national department. And I, I do think that now we need data to submit monthly reports on the matter so that we can also uh, keep the keep the CETA programs accountable. Um, but uh, uh, Mr. Tuf Tofi, I will I will revert to you for allocation or comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, certainly, your, your 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 issue of the escalating it to national that is noted, and we will report to you on a monthly basis. So, Elsa, if you could note that, and we will we will take action and just address it immediately to Minister. On the how do we improve the quality of educate of education and training? I mean, I'll. I'll ask that any members, you know, raise your hand from any of the entities if you'd like to comment. But I was wondering, again, it's just a, we're almost brainstorming here, but I wonder if, based on Mr. van der Westeisen's um, question, whether we, we have ever engaged CIDB to, to see if we could possibly get some, some technical skills. I think we, if we're focusing particularly on the skills of people who need to tender, but I agree with you, we need to try to look at improving the the quality of, of training. So I would ask that if any of the entities want to address that one. And then Nizam, will you answer the question about um, leveraging the, 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 the issue on skills and then the remote learning, Kashifa? We do a lot of remote training. I know with our Office of the Consumer Protector, we do all our, our, our consumer education now remotely, sometimes even on a low tech solution like WhatsApp and channels and so forth. So you do you do a little talk and then some questions and answer using WhatsApp. So, but I'd love you to just comment on whether you've considered or, or have used the remote um, learning using an online method. I think those are the main questions. So we, there's not too many. Um, would anybody like to comment on the on how we improve the educational levels of trainers and those technical skills? I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm putting it out there for you to put up your hand if you'd like to comment. So. I see Kashifa, you and Patrick would like to comment. Yeah, maybe go for it. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, thanks, and thank you to the members for the questions. I was just going to say, Patrick will answer the first uh, question on the impression from the quality of the training that 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 uh, we facilitate, um, and I will answer the question on uh, the the idea that uh, Member Bartman, the chair, gave. Yeah, it's um, also sorry. I, I had realised that. Uh, um, uh, member and Kontler had asked the question of the aim of the high school program, just to make that clearer. So it, it is to improve the maths outcomes because, and the first phase is targeting the mathematics teachers to improve the, you know, use of digital tools in the teaching and delivery of the curriculum. So uh, that's why the partnership with the Western Cape Education Department is so important because uh, we want to obviously monitor that over time. I just wanted to, uh, I forgot to answer that, but uh, I will, I'll answer the, the question on remote learning and then hand over to Patrick on the, 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 the quality of training. Yeah, I think um, we need to, we, we've, we've been guided by the Western Cape Edu Education Department as to, as to the modes uh, that we can use to engage with learners. Um, and we have been doing online uh, learning with the teachers for the for the course that they've been on, so it, but it, you know um, I think just last week we had the the, the junior mayor 
um, from the, the municipality speak at, a, at the youth event um, that the municipality had uh, um, organized. And it's a, it's a scholar from uh, Hopefield High School and he had he had said that you know what they need is internet at schools, um, because it's you know the, the the pandemic has shown them that uh, they they need full broadband internet at schools and right through the schools and you know at at across the municipality really um, if for those that are learning from home, so. Um, we're working with the Western, with, with the Department of Education to see so with the resources that they have and the way things are at the moment with uh, th th what we can actually do um, because not all of the schools have internet across the facility uh, only some of them only have internet like for example in the administration building or so forth. So, but we're, we're very eager to get going with engaging with the schools and um, we will certainly look at, at the feasibility of, of all of those options to make it work. Um, we're not um, going to step away from this, but we obviously also have to respect what COVID is doing to, to, our, to our whole new way of having to um, live and teach. So, thanks. Uh, Patrick? Yes, uh, thank you, Koshifra. Chair, yes, uh, it was, um, the one thing that we acknowledged, uh, Chair, was that, um, or is, the fact that quality assurance is the prerogative of the respective CETAs and, and recently also the QCTO. Uh, but be because we received the funding and uh, we are the ones that signed uh, the, um, uh, the, membran the, the uh, funding agreements with the respective CETA, what we've done is we've built, we have in-house uh, uh, quality assurance capacity that we've actually established within the IDZ. And the first thing that we did was with our service providers who are uh, actually our implementers of skills development and training, we, we, we've, we since 2015, I think, yes, since 2015, we had budgets where we uh, assist them with the training of their facilitators. That is now outside of what they are supposed to, to do. So we would fund uh, uh, training of facilitators, also moderators and, and assessors. Um, which we would, uh, uh, so that we can ensure that the quality of training that those service providers uh, provide to, to the learners are in line with the quality that industry wants. That's the first thing. The second one is uh, we have, uh, I know that Stanley, our, uh, our associate skills development has a monthly meeting and it's a monthly engagement with our service providers where we literally go and we monitor and identify challenges with regards to the training itself and also to ensure that the quality of training that they provide to the learners are in line with, 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 with all requirements of SACWA and also the respective CETAs and QCTO. So we are proactively involved in that space with our respective implementers. Uh, we also engage with our learners. We have a skills project officer and the skills project officer's job is really to look at from the other side. Uh, whilst uh, Stanley would, look, would, would engage with our, our service providers uh, from an implementing side, the skills project officer will typically engage with learners just to assess whether the learning that they receive and the quality of learning that they receive is in line with what we sign with our respective service providers and also with the CETAs. Um, so those are the, the type of interventions uh, that we currently implement. Uh, we are now looking at new ways also to, to, to see how we, can, how we can monitor the, the, the non-unit standard based and specialized training which which are not SACWA accredited, which is also not obviously uh, uh, quality assured by our CETAs, but by the industry itself. So what we're trying to do now is to get alignment in terms of the quality of those type of training going forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Kashipa and, and Patrick. Nizam, would you like to chat, uh, just comment on the question about just working a little bit harder. No, no, I know, I know the spirit of what uh, the chair meant, but just comment on that issue of funding and how we can, how uh, what you've done already and how we can possibly do more so, of such leveraging. Thank you, Rashid, and thank you, Chairperson, for the, the question. Uh, Chairperson, a 40 million rand cut in that particular um, project represents a 70% 70, 70 um, cut in budget for that particular um, initiative. Um, and it's also important to understand how we leverage those funding, Chairperson. So we use every one rand of our funds. We 
set a target for every one rand of voted funds, we leverage one rand. In the past year, every one rand, we leveraged two rand. Now, the reason for that is because the environment was constrained, was difficult for anyone to run credible programs, the CETAs typically contact the department. Very often, we don't contact the um, traditionally departments as to contact a CETA. Because we've got a history of running those programs as well as we do, the CETAs typically come to the department and say, please, here's some money, could you please respond to that bid. But we do have to put in our own money to leverage other money. Um, so if we have less of our own voted funds, we can le leverage less. Now the CETAs also have targets and they also report on funding leverage. So it does make it, it, does make it slightly uh, um, difficult to with a constrained environment. Now, of course, we do understand that everyone had to take budget cuts. We took a budget cut and the truth is there's cuts across the whole skills ecosystem. Um, the CETA funding comes through the 1% levy that firms have to pay to the CETAs. Now, two things happened last year. One is there was a three-month moratorium on a holiday on firm payments to CETAs because of COVID. So immediately you've got a 25% decline in overall CETA budgets. Then you've got a decline in economic activity and um, wages. So you have a decline in another decline in funding going towards CETA. So you have less money at CETA. And the same can be said for the NSF and other projects and, and the jobs fund. So there's just less money in the ecosystem for us to find funds from. Uh, most of our funds actually comes from private sector and there also we've got a constrained area. So we work as hard as we possibly can, um, 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 Chairperson, uh, we, we'll, we'll sort of be what's a boxer in um, Animal Farm, we'll just work a bit harder, but uh, we just want to warn um, the um, committee that it's become much more constrained, the environment that, that we work on, work in. Uh, I just also want to quickly mention, Rashid, if I, if I may, around the quality of, of, of education out there. Um, member of Fund Investigation, we measure the quality of, of the training based on what the job rate is um, post that training. And on our artisanal development programs, this is CETA accredited programs, we've got nearly 100% placement post the intervention. So those particular programs are run exceptionally well, and the moderation and quality by the CETAs is absolutely Top notch. Um, if there is an area where we, we could strengthen the ecosystem, it's less perhaps around the, the quality of the teachers, but the quality of the courses and programs. So we are demand led and we let firms tell us what courses they want um, support from because they wouldn't employ these individuals. So we find often that the courses take a very long time. And I'll give you one quick example. If you want to become a motor mechanic and you go to a public TV college, you're going to work on a, a 1979 120Y Nis, not listen, Datsun engine. Um, whereas what you should work for a BMW or, or any other um, garage. So I think that it's the level of, of, of funds available in the ecosystem that's a problem, and perhaps the, the course content that's a problem. And, and as much as there's a problem with, with um, there may be a problem with some of the teachers, but the acute problem is there. So thank you, Rashid, and thank you, Chairperson. Thanks, Nizam. Uh, Chair, have we covered that second round of questions? Do you feel I've, I think I've ticked them all off? Thank you, Mr. Tofi. I think that you have covered um, all of them. I've ticked them all off by my side, so I'm assuming that is all. Um, yeah, it is. It is very. It's a very difficult environment, and it seems there's bailouts for everyone. There's bailouts for ESCOM. There's bailouts for SAA. There's bailouts for Denel. But it's like Oprah's favorite things. But there's no bailout for skills and development and jobs. But um, regarding the construction CETA specifically, um, Mr. I think it was Patrick that was telling us about the construction CETA. If he could just indicate to us, please, how many of the certificates from the CETA are outstanding? And Mr. Tofi, Saldana Bay IDZ, with the construction CETAs that are outstanding, they need to use their minister, they have a whole minister, 
and the minister, when he writes to the national minister about the CAF CETA, you must also ask for the certificates of the construction CETAs because it cannot be the people who have completed their training and courses and things like that are still without certificates. And you must almost say that he wants the certificates within 30 working days because we cannot have years and years and years going on and then people still don't have these certificates. It's also unacceptable. So, Saldana by IDZ, Ms. Birkus, please, you must use your minister. Colleagues, are there any other follow ups? If none, uh, Mr. Tofi, if you have any closing remarks and or if uh, the respective entities uh, uh, still online have any closing remarks that they would like to add. Thank you, Chair. Um, does, would anyone like to make any closing remarks before I make mine? Um, Kashifa, can I go to you? Are you covered? Yeah, no, thank, thank you. I just wanted to uh, appreciate the chairperson's um, sentiment and um, we we will, yeah, we, we certainly um, will use our minister, um, <laughs> if I can use that language, um, where, we, uh, where we have these challenges. Um, but I just wanted to say that uh, in, in dealing with the challenges that we face with the CETA, um, yeah, maybe... Maybe it was it, it was a call that we made at the time to ensure that learners still you know got the training that and met their expectations and that they weren't stopped from the you know bettering their future by uh, bureaucracy. So what we did is we actually shifted those students to other courses that were funded by Mercita and accredited as such and, and the chemical CETA and algae CETA. So. They did manage to get certificates at the end, um, and uh, yeah. But I, I do take the point of that there's something systemic here that needs to be addressed. But I want to thank my colleagues on the call for answering and participating so professionally and and with uh, full spirit, and for all of the members' contributions. It uh, it helps us to redirect our focus and uh, review our our plans going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Kashifa. Um, Pierre, from your side, any closing remarks? From my side, uh, Rashid, thank you very much. And thanks for the standing committee. And it's nice to report you on our um, limited progress over the last year. And I hope it will grow exponentially. We're working very hard at it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre and Ellen. So the West Grove colleagues are not here. So in wrap, to wrap up, Chairperson, thank you for, yeah, for nudging us in that direction. I would ask that it, it, it helps us when we put that motivation together, which we'll do in the next week or so. Um, Kashifa, please send me send me that letter addressed to me if you like, and I'll take it up directly with the minister and the HOD. Um, and we'll we'll escalate those things as soon as possible. And chairperson, if you want to add a letter from the from the standing committee, that would also that would be fantastic, and it can go as a as a double motivation up to national. But in, in closing, I just want to thank everybody again. Thank you for the contributors, but also thank you for the questions. This kind of this kind of interrogation, I can feel the passion and the interest that you all have in this. And um, yeah, we'll keep doing our best to, 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 to do what we do every day. So thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Tofi. And I just also, and I will take your recommendation and ask the members if we can support that recommendation. But... Uh, between the Department of Economic Development and Tourism and the Provincial Department of Basic Education and the respective entities, please, you guys must become hashtag besties. You must, at the very minimum, must be meeting regularly on the demand and the supply. How do we create jobs? And how do we, how do we get skills and development for those jobs? Uh, as a belief, you guys must work together as if you're living in the same house. Uh, but thank you so much to the department and the respective entities on the presentations today. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing. And, and thank you to the members also for the robust debate that we always had. We are, we are not here to try and catch anyone out. We, we want the best for the residents of the Western Cape. But with that, thank you so much. You may now be excused and the members will continue with the respective uh, committee administration. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, members. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Chairperson. Bye.
Okay, thank members. While everyone is leaving, um, let me just quickly see. Ya. Okay, members, are there any resolutions? Let's do. I think let's do the resolutions to to the presentations and and so on now, and then I will deal with any other administration after that. I will take hands now. Uh, member van der Westhuizen, any other hands? Okay, if none, I'll put uh, my request for resolutions after member van der Westhuizen. Member, you may go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I would uh, propose that we express our appreciation for uh, the work and the funding that is being uh, uh, channeled to uh, skills training in the Western Cape by this department as well as to the the entities uh, as, as I believe you know a skilled workforce is absolutely uh, necessary for us to emerge from the economic uh, situation where we are at uh, uh, currently. So I, I first would like to, to us acknowledging that. And then secondly, uh, that we also uh, see to what extent would we be able to, uh, or would these entities be able or encourage them, these entities to try and leverage even more funding from uh, those sources, those funds that are actually there to, uh, and that's supposed to fund uh, training such as the National Skills Fund and the various CETAs, as well as the budgets of uh, employers who contribute uh, you know, to the National Skills Fund and who, who can also be a conduit to access uh, the training in, in this regard. And that we encourage them to you know, uh, e even uh, up the numbers of people trained as uh, we've seen that they've got great success uh, according to what we've been presented with this morning and then eventually placing those learners once they've gained the uh, appropriate skills. Uh, that's my first proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Are there any objections um, or amendments to that before I go to mine? Okay, none. So those resolutions stand then. I would like to add that we take up the resolution that regarding the CAF CETA that the minister must urgently write to the respective national minister regarding the six month backlog. Um, and that must be addressed. It cannot be six months. And that also the minister or and or the department must then make a monthly report to this committee until the backlog has completely been addressed regarding the, the CAF CETA that we heard about but also that he must take up the systemic problems uh, that we've heard about now in terms of the construction CETA, such as delays and certificates, and that uh, the SD, uh, Saldana Bay needs to liaise with him in that particular matter. And I would also like to put that, uh, that Saldana Bay IDZ uh, regarding the, the training that they do for learners in terms of their programs, that they must please come up with a strategy for online training or online learning then for the students and they must engage with the Department of Basic Education, the, the provincial one, um, as well as DDAT in order to come up with a way to, 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 to use remote learning or online learning to continue with the programs that they, that they already have. Um, so that is my request for, for resolutions. And then we have already previously resolved to have the CETAs before us, so we don't need to resolve that one again. Are there any objections or amendments to the current resolutions that I've now put? Okay, none. I will allow another opportunity for resolutions if there are any. Uh, Member van der Westhuizen, is that a new hand? Correct, Chair. Okay, you may go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the, the, the CETAs, uh, as I've said, mostly uh, channel their funds through employers. But as we've seen uh, in the presentation today, great success has been had where unemployed people have been 
given access to funded training because that is the that is the challenge obviously you know uh, it's one thing to upskill your existing workforce as many employers do but employers don't generally go out and organize training for the unemployed uh, and i think this is where in the western cape with the intervention from the department there's been great success and i would like us perhaps just to f first acknowledge that the training of the 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 unemployed and and then secondly also ask them to uh, because of that kind of placement percentage i think uh, we can safely say that the the, the the demand for those skills is absolutely there and that we not only congratulate the department on the training of unemployed people but also uh, ask them to if possible scale up on on that training specifically you know to have unemployed people eventually prepared and placed in um, in, in in these full-time jobs thank you Okay, so that is just an addition to Member van der Weijstaisen's original uh, request for resolution, and since no one objected to it or amended it, that resolution still stands. Okay, if there are no other resolutions, we can go over to the other committee business then. Uh, Ms. Adams, do we have any minutes before us today? Uh, yes, Chair, we have the minutes of the 12th of May and the 26th of May. I think Lizette has those ready. Okay, Ms. Scooter, uh, if you can put up the first one for us, please. Okay, let's see how quickly. 26th May. Okay. Colleagues, the minutes is before you. Let's go to page one. Okay, just check the names and everything. Let's go down. Okay, that's page one. You can go to page two. Okay, let's go down. If we go down, please. Okay, page three. Okay, let's go down. Okay, let's go down. That's page three, page four. Okay, that's just signature and stuff. Okay, members with that, if I could have a mover for the minutes, please. Member van der Westeisen. I move that we adopt the minutes, Jay. Thank you so much. If I could have a seconder for the minutes. Member Maseko. Chair, I second. Thank you so much. Yeah. With that, the minutes is adopted. Can we go to the second set of minutes? Okay, let's see there quickly. Okay. Okay, that's page one. You can just check everyone's names are correct and so on. Go down, page one, page two, let's go down. Okay, let's go down. Page three. Let's go down. You can go down. Okay, page four. Perfect, go down, page five. Okay, with that, if I could please have a mover for the minutes. Noting that we did have one different member at the time, and member van der Westeisen, you may go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, 
uh, move that we adopt the minutes, just two things, uh, and it's it's not serious, but perhaps for going forward. The first one, if there's a surname like van der Westeisen or van Nikert, that normally, unless there are initials before that, that the first letter, the V, uh, uh, be uh, an uppercase uh, letter, uh, uh, we don't need to change it now, but uh, for future use. And then secondly, in terms of, I think, the uh, current accepted way to express time, if, uh, for example, we would say it's uh, not 11H28 or 11H30, uh, but 11 and then a double punt uh, with, with the minutes after that. So, yeah, I see there, uh, it seems to me Ms. Lutte is already fixing that. Uh, I, but I think we can adopt the minutes. I move, sir. Okay, I just want to um, indicate that if it's 12 double, you know, the do double dot of four, then we would have to put AM or PM behind it. We do usually use the H. It is also very similar to the military style of saying like 100 and 100 and stuff like that. But if members want it to, to be the double dot thingy, but then we must just add AM or PM in that as well afterwards. Um, and the V in this particular minutes is already a capital member. Are you happy with that? It, it has been changed now. Uh, if, 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 if you start at the beginning of the sentence, then it's good. But you okay. will see if you scroll through the document where it says member van der Westeisen. Oh, okay. Can we quickly thing. go? Can we but then it's, quickly it's, go it's, to where it says? It's, 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 yeah, then there you see we've just two. passed one. Page we've two. Just one. The scripter. But as I've said, that's for going forward, Chair. It, it, it doesn't alter the contents of the no, minutes. Fine. We can we can edit it now, and then it is correct. There we go. Let's just see quickly in the next page, page three. Um, okay, go down, page four. There, it is. there we go. Okay, let's go down. Okay, those are the only ones. And can you just put an AM or a PM there after the 12.04, please? PM? Un un unless the convention is to go on to 13 and 14 and 15 hours, I don't know what the convention is uh, with the Western uh. Cape. Yes, Sorry, person, if I can just indicate, if we're going to use the um, colon, you don't need to say AM or PM because like, okay. the stuff under we said we'll move on to 13, 14, 15. Okay, that's fine. Okay, you can then take that out. You can just leave the, the colon thingy. I'm not even sure if that is the correct word for it, but <laughs> just you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Colleagues, uh, member from the VS station, are you happy with that? You did move. So are you happy with moving with the amendments? Agreed. Okay. If I could have a seconder for the 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 minutes, please. Um, I think Member Maseko, you weren't in the meeting. I think it's only Member Mkondla that was in this particular meeting. If I can just check quickly. Um, yes, Member Mkondla, are you happy with the minutes with the edit edits? Yes, I present. Okay, perfect. With that, those particular minutes are moved and adopted. Okay, is there any other general administration, Ms. Adams? I can't think of anything else right now. Um, thanks, Chair. There's nothing um, else in terms of documents. Just a reminder for the members that about the oversight visit on the 23rd of June, um, where it's changed now, we won't be doing the briefing at um, VK Town Port. We'll be doing it in the chamber starting at 8 o'clock um, because of um, venue capacity constraints in terms of COVID. Um, at Transnet, so they've asked if we can move venue and so the chamber is now available for that. Um, we will then be leaving from there, um, from the legislature um, at about one half past twelve um, to do the walkabout at the Cape Town port. I've just been liaising with Transnet now and um, they've said, um, they've given me the protocols which I will send on to members. Um, I've already sent some information in terms of um, that safety acts and vests will be provided. Members should be wearing flat-soled shoes. 
closed shoes. Um, and now Transnet has just indicated to me that um, we will need to use their transport. So um, they'll provide it, be providing shuttles for us as well. So I just need members maybe to indicate that they'll be attending um, and doing the walkabout um, so that I have the proper numbers for Transnet. If that can be done, please. Ms. Ms. Adams, regarding the shuttle, are they picking us up at WSVP or do we go there to them and then they pick us up from the gate? Um, I think they'll be picking us up at the legislature because they'll be at the legislature with us. Um, so all the stakeholders, um, Citrus Garros Association, DDAT, um, Transnet will all be at the chamber, so they will pick us up there. And I'm just confirming the other as in returning to the legislature, etc. They've literally just emailed me, so very new. I just need to sort out a few details. Okay, perfect. Members, you've heard the, the extra detail regarding the 23rd of June, so you can just indicate to the procedural officer when you, uh, uh, via email if you're attending or not. Um, we do also have WCPP vests, which were previously provided to us, but if if you don't have yours on hand or you're busy traveling, then you know safety vests will also be provided. If members can also just please remember about the closed shoes, please. That would be wonderful. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that uh, we are a member and Kondra did ask that uh, if we can just remember regarding the scheduling of the Spaza shop uh, oversight, but we are still looking for a date because we do need more than just the morning session. Um, and that obviously then impacts on other committees and sittings and their respective programs as well. So we're just all looking for a date for that. But we have not forgotten. But Member Nkondo, just extra feedback, those documents that you asked for, we will we will ask the department that when we do the briefing and the oversight that they also just provide those documentation beforehand to us if that is in order. Members, are there anything else from your side? Okay, if none, colleagues, thank you so much for today's briefing, uh, being here online with us. Thank you so much for the robust discussion and, and always assisting with ensuring that we keep our departments and entities uh, accountable. And with that, I wish you a safe and wonderful day further. Thank you and goodbye.